My name is Captain Daniel Harris, and my years of service in Special Forces Unit have led me into countless harrowing situations. Still, nothing could have prepared me for the chilling mission beneath the abandoned Tuffelsberg radar station in Berlin. On the surface, our objective seemed straightforward. Locate the hidden Cold War, era bunker rumored to contain classified secrets capable of reshaping modern geopolitics. The mission's shroud of secrecy and aura of historical enigma fueled our anticipation. Our elite team, well-versed in urban exploration, moved with calculated precision as we descended into the depths of the decaying radar station. The air was heavy with the acrid scent of dampness and decay, and our footsteps reverberated through the dimly lit corridors. Our headlamps cast eerie, flickering shadows on the graffiti-laden walls, remnants of the station's past. We finally reached a substantial steel door, cleverly concealed behind a faux wall which led into a sprawling underground complex. It was here, in the heart of this clandestine subterranean world, that we confronted a chilling enigma. As we entered a spacious chamber, we were confronted by a creature that defied all explanation. Standing at an imposing height of nearly eight feet, it possessed the torso of a man. Yet its limbs and head were reminiscent of a massive wolf or dog. Its fur was a tangled mass of dark ashen gray, and its eyes emitted an unsettling, malevolent glow. Before we could react, the creature sprang upon us with astounding speed and ferocity. In the ensuing pandemonium, two of my comrades succumbed to the beast's savage claws, their agonized cries resonating through the underground chamber. The rest of us fought desperately to shield our fallen comrades and repel the assailant. After what seemed like an eternity, the creature withdrew, having seemingly completed its mission to protect the hidden bunker. It darted into the labyrinthine passageways, disappearing into the depths, leaving behind a scene of unspeakable horror and sorrow. We regrouped, our faces reflecting the shock and confusion that the unfathomable encounter had inflicted upon us. Despite our unnerving experience, our orders remained resolute. Find the bunker and unveil its long-guarded secrets. Though haunted by the memory of the dogman and the comrades we had lost, we proceeded with our mission. Upon reaching the heart of the bunker, we uncovered a trove of classified documents and artifacts from the Cold War era. The treasure trove contained intelligence and technology capable of reshaping the geopolitical landscape. Our mission was an unequivocal success. Reluctantly, we made contact with our general, relaying the inconceivable encounter with this dogman type of thing. His response was fraught with skepticism, urging us to focus on the task at hand and leave the tales of monsters to folklore. Despite the doubts of our superiors, we knew the veracity of our experience beneath Tufelsberg. We resolved to resume our search for the enigmatic creature, driven by a determination to unearth the truth regarding its origins and purpose. Whether the dogman was a product of Cold War experimentation or a more sinister force, our encounter continued to haunt our thoughts as we ventured further into the shadowy depths of the concealed bunker. Hello. My name is Arnold, and I was contacted by my doppelganger. I know it sounds crazy that I am still alive, but hear me out. Not even a month ago, I was very skeptical about all of this mythology and urban legend stuff. I never thought that a Wendigo would be real or Bigfoot, and certainly not doppelgangers. This all changed when the start of this month I was out looking for a story to write about. I'm a journalist for my local news branch which I will keep anonymous. I was told by this elderly woman that she has been experiencing weird and supernatural stuff around her small ranch, which was about ten minutes outside of the city. She said, I keep hearing voices and cries of my children outside, begging to come in. My kids died years ago in a house fire. I know I'm not crazy. Can you investigate? You're my last hope because the police just think I'm old and senile. 
I wrote all of this down, including her address. I expressed concern, but at the time it was a feign. I didn't believe a lick of what she said, since to me this stuff was all explained by science. But in case there were some pranksters or whatever, I decided to pack up some supplies I bought years ago. You see, when I was younger, my father and I used to go bow hunting in the woods behind his house. A year ago at night, I was spending the night there as we plan on tracking this giant buck that kept walking near the home. I remember the night he went missing since I had an emergency at work. He and I were sitting there drinking coffee and remembering the good old days of when I was a teen, how he and I used to hunt every weekend and how we always brought something back home to eat. I can see now the smell of dark roasted Folgers coffee on the pot with slightly stale Walmart donuts. I was flipping through a book that had that old book smell, you know. It was a great night. However, around midnight, my boss and editor called me on an emergency. Turns out a kid went missing a year ago, and they just found her, and they had the first interview with her. It was going to be with me since I was the most experienced with trauma cases. I packed my stuff and hugged my dad. Where are you going, son? We got a big prize tomorrow morning. Are you going to be back by then? He looked at me slightly worried, but I said, of course. We've been tracking it since Mom died. I won't miss this for the world. Just my job called on a huge interview, and they need me. He looked at me, nodded, and I walked out the door. I could sworn I saw him cry a little, but that's hindsight looking back. After the interview, I went back home and set an alarm for 4 a.m. This was so I can wake up in time to go to my dad's and start packing up. When I woke up, it was noon, and I was extremely late. I rushed to the cabin and saw a note my dad left on the door. I wish you were here, but honestly, I'm glad you didn't show up. I love you, son, and I'm going to get this son of a bitch. Stay here and wait. I left coffee on warm for you. I smiled at the note I saw and how he still thinks of me as his little boy despite me being twice his size. Hours went past and it was getting dark out. I started to panic when I heard gunshots not far from home. I rushed out with my rifle and followed the noise. The thick bush made it harder and harder to see as the rich vegetation was swallowing the light. I finally got to where the sounds were and it stopped. Instead, I heard something cry out, help me, and it wasn't my dad's voice. I ran back to the cabin at full speed. At this point, the sky was pitch black with a little moonlight shining through the trees. I can hear a large creature chasing me, but I never look back. As I got to the cabin, I heard another gunshot and my dad yelling one final time. Run, boy! Get the F out of here! Hey, you big dumb animal, come here! That was the last thing I heard my father say. I heard screams in the distance as I kept running, and in the morning, the police showed up and found my father's clothes and his severed arm. They said it was a bear attack, which I was so blinded by grief I kept believing until recently. When I arrived at the old woman's home, she greeted me with coffee or tea. I took coffee. I could recognize the smell from anywhere. Folger's dark roast, I said after taking a deep whiff. Well, did you know? She asked with a warm smile. Well, my father used to make us coffee every day after my mother passed away. It was a bonding thing, so this is a sweet delight. She asked, oh, that's good. Do you and your dad spend time often? I looked down at the floor and sniffled a little, because thinking of the night was something of a nightmare. Now, I know, he went missing a year ago, and I haven't had coffee since. But it's a nice gesture and makes me a little happier. She covered her mouth and apologized, but I waved it off, as it wasn't her fault since she didn't know. I got to know her name after sitting a while, Agatha Christie. She has been on the ranch ever since she was a girl, but it's more of a home than a farm nowadays. She said she has a ranch hand that comes out once a day to feed the animals and help her sell the ones ready. However, it's been almost a week, and he hasn't come to work. She's afraid the creatures outside that have been attacking her livestock scared him away. She looked at me and asked if I brought cameras and other things to help find what is causing her all this pain. These things call out to her at night, and she has a few recordings. 
Nothing on camera, just a voice from a tape recorder. She played the most recent tape. For about a minute, it was something calling out, Mom, I'm cold, let me in. At first, it sounded like a child. Agatha was in tears as she was playing this back. That's my boy. That's his voice, she said, covering her mouth. I grabbed the handkerchief and gave it to her for her eyes. Now we know something is out there messing with you. I will set up a few cameras to see what is going on. She hugged me and thanked me. I just want all of this to go away, she said silently. I stood up after a few more minutes of getting details about the property. On the south side of the barn was a fence line that stretched for about 100 yards. I placed one camera every 25 yards and on every corner. These cameras were top of the line motion sensing and night vision cameras with full fork capability and made bulletproof glass. Then I set one up on each facing an entrance to the home. After about an hour of setting it up, we were all set since they were all synced and ready to go. Agatha looked a lot happier than someone is here with her. She locked all the doors and windows and let me stay the night so I can monitor the cameras. In the middle of nowhere, she didn't have internet, but I brought a portable Wi-Fi box to do some research and keep up with my friends who wanted to play some MTGEDADH tonight. After my first game playing my mono green Eldrazi deck, Don't Hate Me, I got a notification on the cameras. One was going crazy saying something is moving. I pulled the camera up and watched the feed. It was a deer. Thank God, just a dumb deer, ha ha. I laughed it off, but then something strange started to happen. It stared right into the camera and slowly walked toward it. This was odd, but deer sometimes sniff and check out wrong. Shit, so I assumed that's what it was doing. As it got closer, I started to notice something was off. It looked like a deer, but had human eyes and blinked irregularly. Every step that it took was wobbly and its legs were backward. Now I know some diseases infect deer to make them look emaciated and do weird shit like run in circles. But this deer just looked in the camera lens as if it were looking at me. It stared at the camera, and when I saw its full face, it had razor-sharp teeth. What the F is that I said quietly. It somehow heard me and snapped its head to the house I was in and smiled showing rows of sharp teeth. Some were gnarled and twisted. What the F is that? I said in a hushed tone. It then lowered itself and twisted its neck toward the camera to show some psychotic smile as it crouched into a stance that was spider-like and began darting toward the home. I quickly got up and grabbed the pistol that I brought in, in case Agatha wasn't lying. Speaking of which, she rushed into my room, crying that it's going to eat me. Please stop it. I hid her behind me and closed the door, slowly walking to the front door, where this thing was pounding its head into it. Each hit got harder and harder, louder and louder. The thumping left a thick paste on the windows that was black and smelled of rot. The sickening smell and the sound of squelching meat slapping on the door were making my stomach churn. Before I got to the end of the steps, I heard a voice. It sounded like mine saying, I'm here to help. Please don't fire. You will only attract it more. I looked toward the kitchen where the sound was coming from. Before I was. Me. But nude and without any discernible male features. It stood there. A doppelganger. My instincts were flaring up with every ounce of me, telling me to run or drop a whole magazine into its chest. Don't fire, trust me. I don't want you or Agatha to be hurt. Your father sent me over a year ago to protect you from this not deer. This thing killed your father and mother and now is gunning for you. I was so confused at the time, but also scared shitless. What the F did you say? My father died last. Before I can finish, it cut me off. He did die last year, and before he did, I fought the not deer off. This thing attacked your father, not me, and not a bear. Our doppelgangers don't look like the ones we're trying to kill or replace, but the ones we're trying to protect, I felt. 
unease not from the copycat, but from the not dear calling my name as if it was my father, let me in, son, I miss you. It said in my father's tone and affection, but a little off, and it was noticeable enough. Okay, I won't shoot, but how the F do we kill that thing? I pointed the gun at the door that was slowly losing its stability. I will handle it. Go upstairs and don't come back down until sunrise. Once it's quiet and the sun is out, go to the edge of the property by the forest. I will speak there. I trusted it. It was life or death, and this was the best thing I can do. I ran upstairs and locked the door Agatha and I was in. We heard the door burst down and heard the two things fighting. Downstairs, yelling and growling were being drowned out by the sound of bones crunching and flesh being ripped and muscle being snapped like rubber bands. It was 8 a.m. when the sound stopped and I heard the door close. After about 30 minutes, Agatha fell asleep and I gathered the courage to open the door and walk downstairs. The walls and floor were covered in blackish green blood and viscera. The smell made me vomit, but the head of the not deer lay on the floor, rotting away at an alarming pace. I kept my whir and walked to the edge of the forest. There I saw my doppelganger slowly appear out of the forest and prop itself against a log. It had a few bruises and cuts, but was mostly fine. I told you I'll protect you. I promised your dad. I didn't know what to say other than I. What are you? Why do people say you kill the people you look like? It looked at me and laughed a little before Audible readjusting its arm back into its socket. There's a lot you don't know. Your dad was a killer of cryptids, and I was his guardian before he died. We protect, but when the person dies, we move on to the next of kin. Doppelgangers serve as a distraction to the potential dangers of the world, and you are from a long line of cryptid killers. I took a step back as my memory started to flood me. I repressed so much, but I remember the things my dad and I hunted were all cryptids. Wendigos, not deer, werewolf, skunk ape, and even lesser known ones like the Grafton Monster. I was so in shock my ears started to ring, and the doppelganger rushed by me to keep me from falling. I shook out of it, and it looked at me with black eyes. Are you okay? It asked with a worried expression. I, 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 yeah. I am okay. I pinched the space between my eyebrows as a headache was climbing. After a short talk, I was convinced it was going to keep me and Agatha safe. However, this ranch has a darker secret, and it wants to see why so many cryptids are attached and attracted to it. That's where I am at now, researching this little home ranch. I will find something. I must find something until I do stay tuned, and good luck out there. Oh, and if you see a doppelganger, do not be afraid, as it could save your life. On Saturday, July 152, 2023, I was at my girlfriend of two years' house. She has a decent backyard, partially open and surrounded by dense woods. Keep in mind, Michigan. The state I live in has some pretty large forests. She has two fire pits in her backyard, one not in the woods and the other in a small clearing in the woods. I walk to get some more firewood from the clearing in the woods to bring up the second fire pit. As I'm collecting, I look up and see two eyes staring down at me. I stand up straight and this thing is literally eye to eye with me. I'm six foot seven. I stands completely still. For the few seconds I look, I can only see a thin body. I haul my butt back to the fire pit, and my girlfriend can tell I'm clearly panicked. She asks me what's wrong, and I tell her clearly what just occurred. She seems iffy, doesn't believe in paranormal occurrences, but believes me. She convinces me to sit with her by the fire and that it was probably just a large animal. About 25 minutes later, the fire is dying down, and suddenly an adult male scream pierces through the air, and it sounds like it came from the forest. We haul butt, leaving the fire smoldering. We stay inside for the rest of the night, and nothing else occurs. Her dad hypothesized it was a deer. He was out of town at the time.
It was in the summer around dusk, and I was camping at a remote campground with my dad. There was a lake right next to the grounds, and my dad and I would trail blaze through the forest, right next to the lake, because if you went far enough, there was a really pretty waterfall. A few strange things happened on this hike. We found a slash pile that had a little kid shoe on top. When we came to a small clearing, my dad had to take a leak to you. He faced one side of the clearing, and I faced the other, and we both clearly heard a child say, I'm over here. My dad thought it was me, and when he realized it wasn't, we spent half an hour looking for someone, but we found nobody. After that, we gave up on going to the waterfall and started to make our way back to camp, but there were clear sounds of something following us, twigs snapping, bushes shaking. We hadn't been camping there since. I was walking around my neighborhood alone once, enjoying the night air and watching the stars. There was this little pond near my house, with a wooded area that had trees, a bench, and a rope swing that went out over the water. I sat down on the bench to look at the stars, and I heard some rustling off to my right towards the trees. Bears were not uncommon where I'm from, so I took out my flashlight and shone it around over there. I didn't see anything. It freaked me out, so I kept my flashlight on and my senses aware, but I stayed on the bench to mull over my thoughts and watch the sky some more. I don't know why I did that, because that's typical horror movie shit. Anyway, a few minutes pass, and I near nothing more, so I lean back into the bench and start to relax a bit. I'm staring up at the sky with my flashlight pointed downwards, so as not to create any light pollution. When I noticed something in the tree in my peripheral vision, I couldn't tell what it was, but the branch was swaying slightly and the rustling noise was back too. I immediately sat up and stared at it, but hadn't shown my flashlight at it yet in case of pissing off some huge bird or something else. I don't think I've ever been that scared. I remember my heart was beating so fast and I could taste blood. I stared at it for what seemed like forever and it slowly stopped moving. But the shape was still there. Bears do climb trees sometimes. So I was hesitant to run away in case that's what it was. So I just kept staring at it. After a while I mustered up the little raisin S. Cahoonies to shine my goddamn light at the tree. It was a man. A man in the tree, crouched in the tree like some silent, naked monkey. He had no expression on his face, but his eyes were open, really, really wide. When my light landed on him, he started to move like he was going to come down, but I didn't stick around to see if he did. I jumped the bench and ran for the hills. I ran to my house and around to the back door and locked myself in without looking back once. I went around and made sure every window and door was locked. I even checked the attic. I never go out alone anymore. I've done multiple tours to Iraq as of now and served in the last Gulf War in Afghanistan. I've seen all kinds of combat up close, but this is an extremely personal story about my own life that I've never told anybody in as much detail. I'm currently in the reserve, so being called up is not an issue, but this is something that I kind of hesitate to tell. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Brian. I'm currently 54, a U.S. Army National Guard veteran. Previous to the Iraqi War, I was in active duty for roughly five years until I was discharged with an injury. I am also a former U.S. Army Ranger who has seen over 18 years of active duty in the military alone, five of which were in Afghanistan. I probably should have been more specific. The rest were spent deep in the jungle in jungle warfare training, as well as engineer courses to improve various infrastructures all throughout the world. I will be sharing a story with you guys that I've never told anybody. It's not just a ghost story. It's something much more. The story takes place in 2002. I was stationed in Iraq. I had deployed alongside my brother, who was also serving in the U.S. Army Infantry Unit that took part in the initial invasion of Iraq. The majority of my unit was stationed there. 
We were working on rebuilding the local structures and bringing order to the cities. It was a relatively quiet tour, but we weren't without our share of action. I was involved in several engagements with the enemy, and even a few with what I can only describe as unknown humanoids. My brother's unit was stationed in the city of Tikrit, which was being used as a base for training new Iraqi soldiers. These guys on the ground were doing some very important work, and they needed a place to stay where they could rest and train. I was brought into my unit because I was a demolitions expert with an additional engineering background. My sergeant had asked me to come in because they needed somebody who could blow up buildings while simultaneously rebuilding them metaphorically, of course, not literally. So I was brought on the team where I was given a special set of engineering tools to meet the needs of. My new unit. After much discussion, I was told when we were done on our task, I would be transferred to Tikrit as a permanent member of my brother's unit. So one day, as I was working on the various infrastructure at the City Hall building, waiting for my brother's unit to arrive, something happened. I don't know how to describe it accurately, so I'll just come right out with it. These flying entities, which reminded me of angels, descended down upon the town. The entities were looking something like large, eight-foot-tall humanoids. They looked like beings wrapped in garbs and had large wings. It appeared as if they were looking for something. I just tried my best to ignore it as I could and focus on my job. The worst thing you could do in the military is become distracted. Kind of impossible with this happening. A lot of the people were, of course, gasping, but many of them were not even phased. They didn't even just descend down and start hovering. They flew in but were very visible. Like I said, they were looking for something. I'll be as basic about it as I can be. They look like winged humanoids. I just continued to try and focus on my work since I had a job to do. I was on the roof of the city hall building when you're on the top of any building. You can see for miles. I was working on an antenna tower when I heard somebody yelling at me in the street. I was a level above the streets, so people normally don't look up to find you unless they need something. He waved me down, and when I get to the edge, he tried telling me something in Arabic. I can only say a few words like knowing yes in Arabic, so I just continued to try and climb down the ladder. As I got closer, he began speaking in English in an American accent, actually, and he said, I know why they're here. Who? I asked him and tried to act naive and into it. He began telling me that the people of this town were going to die, that they had brought this upon themselves. He said they were an aberration and we should stop living in sin. I asked him what he meant and he told me that these beings were sent down to annihilate us because we had let ourselves go. We had allowed things that shouldn't have been allowed and we need to put it into it. I couldn't understand what was happening. He then said he would be able to help me escape but I had to go with him now. I figured at this point things were getting a little crazy with everything happening, so I continued to try and ignore it all. These figures had disappeared to another section of the city, and the man who was yelling at me had now disappeared. Other soldiers were talking about the sightings amongst themselves, but I tried my best to pay no attention to any of this and just continue to follow my orders. I was staying at my brother's unit, since he had chosen for me to come in and train with his unit. They were all stationed in a nearby city, so they knew it very well and were able to guide me. I told my brother what had happened that day. He didn't seem surprised. I asked him what he thought those beings were, and he said they're called Jenny. They disguise themselves as angels and trick many of the men around there. They're like genies, but not in the form of humans and bottles like many people think. They are entities that reside in another realm and can only interact with us when they choose to do so, taking on a physical manifestation. They sometimes bring messages from the future. He told me there were two other djinn that lived in the area. These are demonic beings that can bring terrible wrath upon mankind. They only take physical form when they have something to do. They're able to control and play with the human mind. They are not to be taken lightly. I couldn't believe what was happening. Nothing made sense. 
I was just simply trying to do my job, and now I've been dragged into this whole strange alien conspiracy thing that did not even make any sense. Now, what was I supposed to do? Keep doing my job and not saying anything. Well, to make a very long story short, after returning from the tour, I just felt different, like I knew things that others didn't. I'm unsure of how to describe this feeling inside of me. I've lived with it for years now, and of all my time serving, this was the only one that really reached into the left field for me. Honestly, I never got a conclusive identity on whatever it was I saw, so sharing it actually might help with that. This was about a year old, late August 2022, and I was fishing on Cold Lake, right on the border between Alberta and Saskatchewan. I had one of my most productive fishing days ever there, and kept a few wally to cook for dinner since I bought the tags for them. I tented on the north end of the lake east of the North Bay cabin, since I don't really like campgrounds much. It was probably about 5, 6 p.m. when I set up camp and got the fire going. I do remember I still fished from the bank for an hour or so until I eventually got dinner going. During that period is when I remember first hearing a lot more noises out of the tree line before. Not anything out of the ordinary, mostly just birds and the occasional squirrels. Eventually, I started to get the feeling of something watching me, which actually got me a bit more worried than what I'd usually be is my first thought, albeit not the most rational one, was a cougar. I know what it feels like to be watched by one. It's uncomfortable to say the absolute least, and a terrifyingly surreal experience at worst. Each time I looked back, there wasn't anything watching me that I saw. Eventually, I lost interest and began supper, which is when the sounds of the forest largely stopped. Things felt cold, dead. The forest felt dead. Now even more on guard about a possible cougar or bear, I moved away from the tree line and closer to the shore, as there was a bit of flat ground forming, almost like a beach. I didn't have a firearm at the time, but I did have a can of bear spray on my chest, which moved to my hand. There still wasn't anything visible through the tree line, but the faint sound of what could be footsteps cut through the silence of the forest. In all reality, it was less footsteps and more the sound of an animal moving through the brush that was heard. Weirdly enough, it sort of relaxed me as a cougar likely wouldn't be so carelessly loud, at least it did for a moment. Aware that I was rather vulnerable in my position, I did begin backing up my stuff. Thankfully, my tent wasn't set up yet back in my bag and got near the kayak. What I saw when I looked back up at the tree line not even 20 feet in front of me, however, was likely the most terrifying yet uniquely beautiful moment of my life. Standing upright half behind a tree was a tall, maybe seven feet, dark humanoid thing, vaguely like a Sasquatch, but much thinner, closer to the proportions of a human, covered in reddish brown hair or fur. All I could see was its body above the waist, though its arms seemed to extend further down. I couldn't make out much features, though the eyes appeared vaguely yellowish. Oddly enough, after the initial shock wore off, it didn't seem threatening. If anything, I want to say it was. Curious? What I'm about to say next defies all common logic all human reason, but as someone standing face to face with what could have been death itself, I raised my arm in the air. The best way I could describe this scene is if anybody has ever watched the fantastic Mr. Fox, the scene at the end with the wolf. That's the closest thing I could compare it to. The creature didn't come any closer, nor did it make a sound, but instead oddly attempted to mimic me, raising its long, thin arm in the air before setting it back down and walking back into the tree line. What I saw that day, the creature I witnessed, led me to reevaluate my opinions towards these animals, that they weren't just animals. These are intelligent creatures, and the time it took to kayak back to civilization immediately afterwards, and the time since then has only reaffirmed my belief in that. 
Of all the encounters people have had with what could be a Sasquatch, I'm glad mine became almost a positive memory. Whatever I saw that day left an impression on me, human, Sasquatch, whatever. I went to college in the prairie country of Minnesota. There wasn't a whole lot of public ground, but there were a few pretty large swamps that kept people out. Scouting the edge of the corn in October, I found an absolutely torn-up corner of the field next to one of these swamps. Great rubs everywhere, and a trail straight through the marsh leading back to a strip of trees on the only high ground around. I came back with my waters and a few climbing sticks the next week, and after about a half-mile walk through knee-to-chest-deep swamp, made it out and up into a medium-sized oak for an evening's sake. Saw a monster buck, but that's another story. Shooting time came and went, and just as I'm lowering my bow down, I hear the most blood-chilling sound I've heard in the woods. I can only describe it as a mountain lion crossed with someone being murdered, along with growling, hissing, and crashing. It first started about 50 yards off, and of course, as darkness fell, the sound inched closer and closer to my tree. At this point, I'm losing it, trying to convince myself the odds of a cougar this far south are pretty slim, but that didn't help thinking about what the alternatives might be. Well, it finally reached my tree, and I was able to light it up with my phone flash. Last week, I decided to go camping at a nearby national park. I'm an experienced camper, and I had camped this particular spot dozens of times. I parked in the designated parking spot for campers and grabbed my gear. I headed off into the wilderness. I normally like to get away from people. I can cover 20 miles in a day, but I don't normally do that every time. I had been walking for about five hours, so I was a five-hour hike from my car. I knew I was far from the normal tourists and family gatherings. That was my intention. It was close to sundown and was starting to get dark. Walking along the trail in the forest, it gets pitch black really quickly. I had not seen another person for a few hours. I had a pretty good idea that I was alone, and the chances of coming across another camper were small, as late as it was and as far off as I was. I was walking to where I was going to set up my tent for the night, and I could only see about ten feet in front of me, and it was getting darker by the minute. Eventually, it would be pitch black. There are no lights out there off the grid. Normally, the only light is from your fire, or flashlight, or cell phone. As I was walking, I heard what sounded like footsteps coming just beyond my available light. Off in the trees, about forty yards away, I stopped to listen and try to figure out what it was. I stood there scanning the distance, but the noise had stopped. I then spotted what looked like a dark figure standing behind or next to a tree. I couldn't tell which. Whatever it was was just standing there. I couldn't make out the shape very well, so I I thought it was a deer. I stood there quiet, looking at it. I have to admit, being alone and so far from any help, I was a little spooked. I've heard stories of murderers who attack unsuspecting campers or hikers in some national parks because of how vast the area is and how vulnerable the people are being far away from civilians. I stood there for a few minutes, scared that it was going to start coming towards me. I was not sure what it was. I didn't know if it was a wild animal. Those can attack humans, too. I decided to turn around, keeping my eyes on the mysterious dark figure. I was scared that it was going to follow me. I knew I couldn't walk all night, five hours back to my car in the dark. I was tired, and I didn't want to make any light. My plan was to stay quiet and lay on the ground until dawn. I would sleep if everything was kosher. I walked about a football field away until I could not see it, and unrolled my sleeping bag. I laid there looking in that direction and listening. About 45 minutes went by and I heard the footsteps in the distance. My heart began racing because I could not see anything at this point. I didn't know if it was an animal. Whatever it was would take a few steps and stop, take a few steps and stop, over and over. 
I couldn't see, but from the direction of the noise, whatever it was, walked to my side about fifteen yards away, then crossed in front of me, then stopped. It was very close. My heart was beating so fast. I was sure it could hear me breathe. It kept going as it crossed in front of me and walked further away. Whatever it was had come very close to me. I laid there too scared to move. I couldn't hear anything. For all I knew, it was standing still right by me. I heard no noises, no human sounds or animal, only the sound of leaves and sticks being walked on. From the time that it crossed in front of me and headed off away from me, and the time I couldn't hear anything, I managed to get my nerves enough to get up and keep walking back to my car. I did not hear or see anything since hearing it come close to me as it crossed my path and head off in the other direction. I made it to my car and there were other cars. The sun was close to coming up and I fell asleep in my car. I could hear people talking and kids laughing as I slept, so I knew it was okay. I know not any blood and guts, but still very creepy. I still don't know what it was. Could have been an animal. I'm just glad that it didn't find me. I remember the time when I was in second grade, returning to school from my lunch hour. As I walked near a clump of trees in a field, I encountered a strange little figure about my own height, standing at just under four feet. The figure had an unusual greenish tone to its skin and was barefoot. Next to it was a round thing from which I assumed the entity had emerged, although I didn't witness this happening. The entity started jabbering at me in a language I couldn't understand. It then took out an object from a belt around its waist, resembling some kind of gun, and squirted a putty-like substance into the palm of its hand. I noticed that the entity had long fingernails that looked like claws. It handed the putty to me, and I was confused by the whole encounter, so I started to move away. When I turned back to look again, both the man and the object had vanished mysteriously. Later on, I confided the bizarre story to one of my teachers. They questioned me about the putty which I showed them. The putty was yellowish with green flecks, about one eighth inch thick and roughly the size of a golf ball. It had a quite hard texture. As I was about to leave, the teacher noticed the object on the ground nearby. It seemed to have definitely shrunk in size. I put it back in my pocket, and that was the last anyone saw of it. I live in the northern end region of Germany's Black Forest, and even though the region is nothing in comparison to United States rural areas, or even rural German areas, it still has its quiet and dark roads. So I am at a school event that went on until late night. You could call it a prom kind of thing, and I take the last bus to my village at 1, 36 a.m. in the town where my school is. The bus ride takes 30 minutes and we're a good 20 minutes into the ride. Aside from me, the driver and one guy who was almost at sleep, the bus is empty, is the road we're driving on. It's the forest stretch right before my village, and it's pitch black. Nothing to see. The bus comes around a corner, and in the middle of the road is a vehicle, Gray Audi A3, with hazards on and both front doors open. The bus driver brakes hardly and comes to a stop right behind the car. Nobody to see, nothing to hear, just the engines running. The bus driver turns around in his seat and opens his mouth to speak when suddenly this woman comes out of the woods, running towards the bus doors. Bus driver, sleepy, or now awake. Guy and I just watch as she starts to hammer against the bus doors, screaming like some kind of animal. Bus driver slams into reverse and then drives away, almost slamming the driver door of the car. We speed through the forest, and at the first stop in civilization, he phones the police and some of his colleagues to inform them. I still don't know what the hell was going on there, but I've heard from friends that they seen similar things. Gray Audi with hazards on, in various parts of the county they and I live in, Still creeps me out, and I normally try to take the bus earlier than midnight or sleep over when I'm away.
On Upper Magnetic Mine Road, my friend and I, Harold Eglin, were exploring the area as my friend decided to meditate. I decided to walk away and take in view of the nearby reservoir. It was then that I noticed something strange. Large and glowing slanted green eyes and large hairless heads floating through the wood several yards away. There were five of them, and I couldn't see their bodies, just their eerie heads. I called out to my friend, and she saw them too. We both stopped moving, feeling a sense of unease. I aimed my large flashlight at them, and in that very moment, the immediate scenery around us changed. Branches appeared in front of us that hadn't been there just a split second before. It was all very surreal and unnerving. A barking black dog was getting closer to us, and with fear in our hearts, we quickly ran back to our rented car. We decided to stay inside for over an hour, hoping whatever we had witnessed would go away. During that time, all we saw were raccoons crossing the road in front of us, almost like a strange parade. It was a baffling and eerie experience that stayed with us for a long time. I remember the strange case of Yabi Gistabode who had gone missing, and later they found him sitting in a bush, appearing to be in a stupor. When they found him, he seemed to be in good health, but the experience had left him shaken. He told us, his family members, a bizarre tale of encountering a man with a square body whom he believed to be an alien. This mysterious man had urged him to go to a strange place. The night before his disappearance, Yabi was dressed in white and seemed to be floating just above the ground. His wife recalled touching his shirt, and it turned black before her eyes. Yabi then passed out, and the incident left everyone puzzled and worried. Then on the 20th, he vanished again, only to be found 11 days later walking towards his home. The strange thing was that his eyes were closed, and he was communicating through sign language. His wife was the one who saw him become invisible on the second night of his disappearance, right before her eyes. It was a bewildering and unnerving experience for all of us. And even though Yabi was found physically fine, the whole incident left us with more questions than answers. To this day, we wonder about the true nature of the events that occurred during his disappearances and what really happened during those mysterious encounters with the square-bodied man and the strange place he was urged to go to. My mom told me a story about my grandfather that you might find interesting. My grandfather was born in Mexico in the 1920s, but grew up in Los Angeles. He was a World War II vet, or Purple Heart recipient, and deeply religious. So much that he built a large altar in his living room where he could kneel and pray each day, complete with statues of the Virgin Mary and Jesus and candles, incense, etc., when I was a kid, I thought this was a normal thing in all grandparents' houses. Because my grandfather was so religious that he basically never lied, from what I'm told, due to his deep faith. Well, apparently, when he was younger, in his 20s, I believe, and perhaps less devout, he and a friend of his were driving and saw an attractive young woman walking down the street. They only saw her from behind and apparently drove up next to her to call out to her. But when she turned around, she had a horse's face, like a real horse's head or face. They allegedly screamed and hit the gas and drove off. As I was told, it was one of the events he personally witnessed that led him to be so religious. I once saw a goat man. I will never forget his two half-inch long teeth and the way he spoke. It was at a concert at Pine Knob in Michigan. I was walking through the crowd and I heard a voice nearby that sounded unnatural and was just wrong. I turned my head and saw him eight, ten feet away. It was the most surreal experience I've had, especially because nobody else noticed or was bothered by this thing. in the vast expanse of Yellowstone National Park. 
I found myself embarking on an expedition with a group of scientists to uncover its hidden mysteries. Armed with state-of-the-art equipment and driven by my insatiable curiosity, I eagerly ventured into the heart of the wilderness, oblivious to the horrors that lay ahead. As a geologist, I had always been captivated by the park's geological wonders. Little did I know that my passion for discovery would soon transform into a nightmarish ordeal. During our exploration, we stumbled upon a concealed cave that had remained untouched for centuries. Inside, we discovered peculiar markings etched on the walls, symbols that defied any explanation we could muster. The air in the cave was laden with an unsettling presence, sending shivers down my spine. Despite the growing unease among my colleagues, I couldn't resist my scientific curiosity and insisted on delving deeper into the cave. With each step, the atmosphere became heavier, and the temperature seemed to plummet inexplicably. Bizarre noises echoed through the narrow passages, and the very walls seemed to pulsate with an ominous energy. As we pressed on, the markings on the cave walls began to convey a chilling tale, a story of an ancient and malevolent entity that had been trapped within its confines for centuries. Initially, we dismissed it as local folklore, attributing the stories to the imaginative tales of tribes in the area. However, as the days passed, our skepticism waned, replaced by an overwhelming sense of dread. Strange occurrences started to plague our team. Vivid nightmares invaded our sleep, and eerie whispers seemed to echo in our ears. Even when no one was speaking, deep within the cave, the unsettling phenomena intensified. Our scientific equipment malfunctioned, and the walls seemed to pulse with an inexplicable malevolence. I struggled to maintain my rationality, but the events unfolding before us defied all logical explanations. One harrowing night, as we gathered around a campfire, the malevolence in the cave peaked. It felt as if the very walls were closing in on us, and an overwhelming darkness enveloped the atmosphere. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, and one of our team members vanished into thin air, leaving us stunned and terrified. Fear gripped us, and we knew we had to escape the clutches of the cave. Yet the malevolent entity was relentless, toying with our minds and exploiting our deepest fears and regrets. Hallucinations and delusions haunted us, making it impossible to distinguish reality from nightmare. With each passing day, our group fractured as each scientist sought their own means of escape from this living nightmare. Guilt weighed heavily on my shoulders, for it was I who had led us into this forsaken place. I became consumed by the need to decipher the ancient symbols, hoping to find a way to banish the malevolent presence once and for all. But the entity was cunning, and it preyed upon my desperation. Whispers crept into my mind, promising knowledge and power beyond comprehension, all in exchange for my soul. I teetered on the brink of madness torn between my scientific mind and the allure of forbidden knowledge. In a moment of desperation, I made a decision that would seal my fate. Driven by the desire to save my team and uncover the secrets of the cave, I made a pact with the ancient entity. In that haunting moment, darkness consumed me, and I became one with the malevolence that had haunted the cave for centuries. The rest of the team, now fractured and traumatized, finally managed to escape the cave's clutches. Yet we carried the horrors we had witnessed with us, haunted by the knowledge that something ancient and evil now roamed the wilds of Yellowstone National Park. Years passed and the cave remained undisturbed, its secrets locked away from the world. My name, Dr. Emily Carter, became a whispered cautionary tale among the scientific community, a stark reminder of the perils of pursuing forbidden knowledge. But deep within the cave, the malevolent presence still stirred, biding its time, waiting for the day it could break free from its ancient prison and unleash its horrors upon the world once more. And so, the tale of Yellowstone's hidden horrors endures, a chilling reminder of the darkness that lurks beneath the surface, waiting to ensnare the foolhardy and the curious alike.
In late August 1986, or possibly 87, I'm not sure which, I drove four friends up from Portland to the south side of Mount Hood to spend three days on the trail that goes round the mountain. We were all 17 or so, and there were two other couples and myself. On the second day, we had made it only to the east side of the mountain going clockwise. I think it was called Sherwood Camp. We found the campsite late and decided to set up on our own near a creek on the opposite side of the trail from the campground sign. A hundred yards or so off the trail in a fairly level, open part of the forest. There was a creek nearby, there were huckleberries out, and we set up our three tents close together. The next morning I got up about 5.30, but noticed from my tent flap the others had all slept in. Some movement about 70 feet away in the berry bushes and evergreens caught my eye. I saw a large, light, beige-colored creature, all covered with hair, seven to eight fall. It's back to me, trying to reach something. A branch, I guess, about 15 feet off the ground. Not more than 10 feet away was this other creature, the same, but small, all covered with hair except for the front of the hands, the bottoms of the feet, and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high and was bending over, picking up a stick, which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set. I could not make out any of the front of the hands. The bottoms of the feet and around the eyes. The second one was only about three feet high and was bending over picking up a stick which it was trying to put in its mouth. The little one was a bit darker in color, a dark beige. The hair on both was up to four inches long at most. The big one was really thick set. I could not make out any of the front of her because she was turned away from me almost the whole time, about a minute. I thought she was the little one's mother. She gave a kind of grunt at the little one like she didn't want him doing that, and he dropped the stick. At that moment, I was on all fours, leaning out of the tent, trying to see better, and my hand popped on a twig, and the big one looked right at me. But all she did for a second was grunt again at the little one, and she reached down, stepped over, and took his hand. It was like she was motioning for him to go with her, and looked in my direction one more time, grunted softly again, and they were gone behind the trees. Their faces were like an ape around the lips and jaws, you know. Their jaws jutted out a bit. Their heads weren't pointed, but I could see by the bare patches around the eyes and skin. On the hands, their skin was a kind of brownish gray. My friends never saw anything, but after we hitched, hiked back to the jeep and were on the way out. I slowed down for a ranger, and he stopped to make sure we were okay. He was an older guy. I didn't get his name. He had gray hair and a bit of a paunch. He was a nice guy. He said this was his first season doing this. And when I told him what I had seen, his eyebrows kind of went up. I didn't report this to anybody else. When I asked for other details, Kay added, Well, when she walked away, she sort of waddled from side to side a bit. When I asked her about smell, she replied nothing that I could tell. Did you look for tracks? No. I was a little scared. We just all got up and packed up after breakfast, and I didn't even want to go over there. All in all, it was a kind of scary but really fascinating thing. The whole thing couldn't have taken more than a minute. A minute and a half at most. But it seemed like five. The details really stuck in my mind. Kay told me there had been no alcohol or drugs and was sure of what she had seen. She said her friends died sometime after that in a car crash, but that that ranger might remember. Around a week and a half ago, I was in Ocean City, New Jersey, and it was around midnight. I decided to take a stroll to the beach to enjoy a cigar and relax. As I gazed out over the ocean, I noticed something unusual. Fourteen bright objects that looked like stars. These objects were perfectly round and resembled any other star you'd see in the night sky. However, they were all flying and dancing around each other in a mesmerizing display. Some of them flickered while most emitted a steady bright light. 
These objects flew in curves and circles, and at one point they all converged closely before suddenly dispersing in all directions. I looked around, hoping to find someone to ask about these mysterious objects, but there wasn't a single soul in sight. I stood there for over ten minutes, captivated by the silent performance in the sky. Their flight patterns resembled how gnats or bugs move with no discernible order or pattern. These objects weren't like any known aircraft, not helicopters, airplanes, satellites, meteors, or comets. One of them caught my attention when it flew towards the horizon, turned around, and rapidly approached me. It passed right by, flying westward over the beach, the Ocean City Strip, and finally disappeared into the bay far out to the west. The speed and maneuverability of these objects left me in awe. I contemplated going back to my house to fetch my phone and return to the beach to capture this extraordinary sight, but I feared they might be gone by then. The round trip would have taken too long, and I didn't want to miss anything. The next day, curious to see if anyone else had witnessed the same thing, I searched on YouTube and looked for articles about Ocean City UFO. But to my surprise, there was nothing. No videos, no articles. It seemed like nobody else had seen what I had experienced. This is the first time I've shared this encounter. While I hesitate to claim that these objects were aliens, they were undoubtedly UFOs to me, simply unidentified flying objects, as I couldn't determine their origin or nature. It remains a mystery, and I still have no idea what they were. It was the strangest and most awe-inspiring sight I've ever witnessed in my life. At the age of 11, my family moved to a large two-story house that overlooked some foothills about 30 miles west of Mount Rainier. Around 2011, I started seeing strange things there. In one instance, I was watching late-night TV with my mom and had my attention caught by what looked like a really bright star in the east by the mountain. I stared at it for about three minutes before the star suddenly dropped straight down into the foothill. I stood up and shouted, scaring my mom. She didn't believe me, but I know what I saw. The second most bizarre occurrence has to have happened after my girlfriend at the time moved in with my family. On three separate occasions, my girlfriend and I were startled by incredibly bright flashes of light in the dead of night that illuminated every corner of whatever room we were in at the time, almost like a camera flash or a lightning strike. The only thing is, we were on the second floor of the house every time, and there were no trees or roofing near any of the windows that would have allowed someone to take a photo without a ladder, but there was nothing when I'd rush over to the windows. They also only happened on hot summer nights, where there wasn't a single cloud in the sky which rules out the possibility of lightning. We both saw the flashes every time, and could never rationalize what they could have been. The Kansas landscape stretched before us as we rumbled down the highway in our RV, laughter echoing through the vehicle. We were a group of friends on a road trip seeking adventure and the thrill of the unknown. Little did we know that our journey would lead us to a place that defied all expectations. As the sun dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the plains, we stumbled upon a seemingly idyllic campground that didn't appear on any of our maps. The air was thick with an otherworldly tranquility, and the surroundings exuded a serene charm that drew us in. Excitement bubbled within us as we decided to make an impromptu stop and set up camp for the night. The air VF eased into a vacant spot surrounded by towering trees that whispered in the gentle breeze. As we unpacked and prepared for the night, we couldn't help but notice the other campers nearby. They sat around their flickering campfires, but something was off, strangely silent, never making eye contact like ghostly apparitions lingering in the shadows. Unsettled but intrigued, we decided to explore the campground, attempting to strike up conversations with our mysterious neighbors. However, our attempts were met with eerie silence, and their humanoid forms seemed frozen in an unnatural stillness. 
The air grew heavy with a sense of foreboding as we realized something wasn't right. Determined to unravel the mystery, we tried to contact the local populace. Our attempts to make calls were met with static or strange, incomprehensible whispers. Frustration and fear gnawed at us as we exchanged worried glances. It was then that we noticed something deeply unsettling about the inhabitants of this phantom campground. They were not human. As the truth dawned upon us, a cold shiver ran down our spines. The humanoid figures around us were like reptiles in disguise, their eyes cold and unblinking. Panic set in as we grasped the gravity of the situation. Without a word, we turned towards the RV and ran, our footsteps echoing through the eerily silent campground. Back at the safety of our RV, hearts pounding, we locked the doors and peered through the windows. The realization that we were not alone, that something beyond our understanding lurked in the shadows, sent a chill through our veins. We struggled to comprehend the bizarre encounter, the reptilian figures etched into our memories. Fear compelled us to put pedal to the metal, the RV roaring to life as we sped away from that surreal campground. The highway blurred beneath us as we left the phantom place behind. Safe distance did little to ease our terror, and silence settled within the RV as we grappled with the inexplicable. As the miles stretched between us and that mysterious spot in Kansas, we exchanged haunted glances. The truth behind the phantom campground remained elusive, leaving us with an inexplicable fear that clung to our hearts. We couldn't explain what had happened, only that we had narrowly escaped a place where the line between reality and the unknown blurred in the most chilling of ways. Navajos growing up on the reservation hear about skinwalkers from time to time. For this reason, nearly everyone is cautious about who they trust or what kinds of things they talk about because Yenad Lucias are dangerous people that have the abilities of animals, yet retain their cunning human minds. My mother has many tales to tell of Yenad Lucias, skinwalkers. She tells us because she wants us to be aware that there are people out there that may want to hurt us or play with our minds. She sometimes tells it to assure me that there is a God and he watches over everyone, even little Navajo children. This true story, which happened in the 1960s, is one of them. One night, she and her four sisters, my aunts, were at home after a long day of shepherding and doing chores. My mom and her sister needed to use the bathroom before going to bed, and so they decided to go to the outhouse together. They didn't have plumbing back then, or running water, as they were living in a traditional hogan. The outhouse was far away, and they didn't want to walk there alone in the darkness, so they decided to go together. It was relatively late. The sole light source was moonlight. As the two finally neared the outhouse, they thought they heard some faint sounds like that of whistling. It was bird-like, but whoever was whistling was following them and was circling the area. They clung to each other, chilled by the sound, and continued on. Oddly enough, the outhouse door was open. Usually, when people use the outhouse, they always latch or wire the door shut. As they came close enough to the outhouse, they saw a large black thing sitting inside. Though they couldn't see its features, they could make out that it was human in nature. Terrified, they screamed in horror and ran back to the Hogan as fast as their legs could carry them. They could hear someone chasing them from behind and that it was gaining on them. As soon as they reached the Hogan, they dashed in and slammed the door. They hurriedly told their other sisters what happened, and they sat in silence waiting for something to happen. The Hogan door wasn't secure. It was only an old, worn-down door with no knob. It had a rickety latch nailed to the inside of the door to keep it closed. Nothing was barring the smoke hole where the chimney rose out. It was open to the air, and you could see the night sky. The person outside began banging on the walls, making all five of them huddle in the middle of the room near the stove. There were heavy objects being thrown now, and a lot of noise. Soon they heard it climb onto the roof. 
Whoever it was was walking back and forth, and every now and then it would peer through the smoke hole at them, its face hidden by darkness. There were adults present, but being a rather rude foster family with kids of their own, they lived in another Hogan some distance away. Though they tried calling out to them, they became angry and didn't answer. Finally, in pure desperation, my mom's three older sisters, being raised Catholic in boarding school, told her and her younger sister to get down on their knees. They began praying to God for protection. One of them had acquired holy water from the church, and she sprinkled it near the door. All night, the skinwalker would circle the hogan, pound on the door, and make that whistling noise, but even though the hogan was improperly secured, that skinwalker never got to break in and hurt them. My mom never found out who tried to hurt them that night. Medicine men can hold a chant for you to see who tried to hurt you, but this was never carried out. Looking back on it now, my mom says that nobody was protecting them that night. Nobody but Heavenly Father, and that he kept them safe from harm's way. The Yenayadlishes would bother them off and on, but not once were they harmed. When my now wife and I first started dating, we would take long walks through our very small town after I got off work at 11 p.m. We would wander through the cemetery, down little country roads, everywhere. But our favorite area was a large field where the stars were incredible. One night we were watching a small meteor shower and heard all kinds of loud grunting and ruckus coming from a tree line. We had nowhere to go and we're starting to get concerned. A large, angry Bigfoot came out, stared at us, and then quietly walked away. I don't think we breathed for several minutes. I was convinced he was coming at us and there was no way to outrun him. We didn't go back there for a few days. I drove to a park to go hiking at night in the mountains. So safe, I know. And I hadn't even turned off my car, and I already feel like I'm being watched. There weren't any cars around, so I thought maybe it was just me being paranoid for some reason. But for some reason, I look to my right, and I see this weird-looking humanoid shape on top of the little bump hill, about 50 feet away. At first, I thought it was a weirdly shaped tree, until I saw the arms move, no wind at all. So now I know there's a person staring at my car, trying not to move, for what I assume is for me to get out of my car and leave to a more secluded area, as we were next to the road. Of course I left. I don't go hiking at night in that particular park anymore. I had received reports of a bunch of noise at the far northeastern section of the park. I was personally called to investigate myself. I brought it to the ranger in charge at the time, and he agreed it would be a good idea for me to go out there during patrols. I took it upon myself to join the other ranger on patrol that evening. The reports were something of screaming at them from behind the trees along one stretch of road near the campsite for several nights in a row. It was described as sounding vaguely human, but also not human. There were two male witnesses, and I made it my mission to speak with them myself. When we got into that section of the park, it was getting dark. By the time we reached where they had been camping previously, it seemed like it might take us a little while to find any evidence. Since it had been about three days since those initial reports, the ranger I was with, whom we'll call Frank, and I split up. He headed off to the left, and I headed off to the right, where it seemed like there would be less dense vegetation. I continued walking, calling out intermittently, hoping to find somebody assuming they were behind the screaming. I would call back every few minutes, and Frank replied saying he was on his way back, but found nothing so far. I got about another 200 yards in, when all of a sudden it sounded like something nearby had crashed through some brush, running. Now normally this wouldn't have been an issue, except it sounded like a very large biped coming towards us. I immediately started heading back in the direction of the vehicle, not really wanting to see what was coming. 
It didn't take a genius to realize that what it sounded like was coming for me. Once I heard this, I did my best to outrun what could turn out to be a bear, or maybe a mountain lion, or maybe worst of all, what others had considered a Sasquatch previously. Before departing from camp that night, Frank had joined me just as we reached our vehicle parked roughly 80 yards away from where he'd been searching when he responded earlier. By this point, there were loud noises everywhere around us, making it impossible now to hear each other without speaking very loudly. The forest was alive with these screams. I quickly suggested we get back into the vehicle. I was not waiting around. We immediately started driving back towards base ops, which was about 15 minutes away from where we were currently stationed on patrol. My heart was racing the entire time. The forest and the night were alive with these creatures or something going on. I was told to write up a detailed report of what had happened to us out there and even gave detailed sketches of the creature that I saw that night, even though I barely did. Frank, however, was questioned. He had very well seen the creatures I did not see between the fear and the shaking. It took quite a bit of time for him to convince himself that he was not hallucinating and that he did indeed see something dangerous. This was all eventually resolved when we decided and were told not to talk about it. I think we, as rangers, accepted that there might be some theories about the mythical Bigfoot and that they are indeed a reality. Of course, this only led to more questions and speculation than actually having fruitful full answers. Let's just say we finished our patrols without incident after that and shared stories of other strange things happening. I'm pretty sure that made believers out of us. At least it did for me. In 1989, I was a U.S. Marine stationed at Camp Pendleton in Southern California as a platoon guide for Company B, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. I lived on the base in Oceanside. I was a corporal, and being a second lieutenant meant it was impossible for me to have a roommate due to space limitations. My chief brought it up with me that I could live with him and his wife off the base if he wanted to. We were pretty close, so he offered it. It was here that the encounter really begins. I'll start with the first one. Living with the chief and his wife wasn't so bad at first, but where they lived, we started to get, how do I say, nightly visits by these things. It started by hearing them just outside the window at night. I would hear heavy footfalls, branches breaking, lots of leaves crunching around. They would always be right over my window. I would just lay there, staring at the closed curtains, praying that whatever it was would just go away. I would always fall asleep before they did every night. It was the same thing, except one night I woke up to them just outside the window, breathing heavily on the glass while watching me. Drool and saliva all over the window. I'm not gonna lie. This was downright terrifying. I was a Marine, for God's sakes. I'm supposed to be able to protect myself. After that night, it was as if they knew I'd seen them. They would come every night, but always to the front portion of the property where we had the largest windows and viewing portion of the front property. It's like these things wanted to be seen. I can never go back to sleep after that, so I would just stay up and wait for them to leave. These encounters continued on for several weeks. I had my other best friend, whom I'll call C. He was invited over to spend the night as well. It was around two um, when these things approached. I heard the usual noises outside the window, but this time it sounded like more than one. I would see shadows pass by my bedroom window. Of course, my chief seemed totally clueless to all this and would spend his nights drunk as a skunk passed out in front of the TV. Go figures. See is another story. He is a Marine veteran who had seen action in the Gulf War, and he knew what we were dealing with. I befriended him while on base, and we ended up meeting in the chow hall, where we became really good friends. So with all this going on, I would invite him over, and my chief did not mind. I think my chief is pretty clueless to these things going on, since he was always drunk and passed out by the time these things would show up. And after he was drunk, good luck waking him up. 
I would always ask Z what it is we should do. He informed me that we were dealing with a very large, upright, bipedal canine, and these things are alpha predators. They will kill. He had dealt with these himself while living up in Michigan for a short while. I went back to my chief and told him what was going on. He laughed it off, said I was delusional. So at this point, I'm pretty convinced that he has no idea. It was at this point that I became very suspicious of him, that he didn't know anything. I think he was living in denial. After a few weeks of this, I was going to go live with my wife's sister up in San Diego. Now comes the best part of this experience. The first night, I didn't sleep there. I expected these things to be there right outside my window, although they never were. To say that first night at my new location was restless and sleepless is an understatement. I didn't realize in hindsight how this thing would really affect my overall sleep patterns. Anyway, I'm not sure what it was that I experienced that day, but it was something else. I'm still completely spooked by the whole thing, just thinking back to it. I would prefer it if it just gets left in the past. It was a warm night in Texas, and I was on my usual route as a professional trucker transporting wood logs from one town to another. The endless stretch of highway had always been a familiar sight. As I drove along the deserted highway, my headlights cutting through the darkness, I noticed two glowing lights in the distance on the road ahead. Intrigued, I thought it might be another vehicle or maybe even a couple of deer crossing the road. I didn't think much of it at first and continued driving, expecting the lights to disappear as I got closer. However, as I approached, the lights didn't fade away. In fact, they seemed to grow brighter and more defined. My curiosity turned into a sense of unease as I realized that the glowing lights were coming from a creature standing in the middle of the road. At first glance, the creature seemed human-like, but its size was something I had never encountered before. Standing at an imposing height of eight to nine feet, or maybe even taller, its eyes were the most striking feature, large and shaped like those of a cat, unlike anything I had ever seen before. The creature's entire being was so black and dark that it seemed to absorb the very light around it. As I got closer, I noticed what appeared to be a cloak covering its body, blending seamlessly with a dark toboggan-like cap that obscured most of its head. The creature was incredibly skinny, almost emaciated, and its eyes shimmered with an eerie shine. Strangely, it seemed to be standing motionless, staring straight ahead as if focused on something intently. I pulled my truck to a halt, unable to believe my eyes. I had seen my fair share of strange sights during my time on the road, but this was something entirely different. The air around me felt charged with an inexplicable energy, and a chill ran down my spine. Suddenly, as if sensing my presence, the creature turned its head toward me. It was as though it could see through the darkness and directly into my soul. Fear gripped me, and I felt a primal instinct to escape this inexplicable encounter. Without a moment's hesitation, I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, hoping to put as much distance between me and the creature as possible. My truck roared to life, and I sped away with reckless abandon, my heart pounding in my chest. The creature reacted instantly, letting out an ear-piercing shriek and breaking into a fast and unnatural sprint, chasing my truck like a nightmarish zombie from the movies. My heart raced, and the adrenaline coursed through my veins as I pushed my truck to its limits, desperate to escape the horrifying encounter behind me. I didn't dare look back. I just kept driving until the glowing lights were nothing but a fading memory. As I left that nightmarish scene behind, I couldn't help but wonder what I had just witnessed. Was it some otherworldly being? An alien or something beyond my understanding? I had no answers, but one thing was certain. I would never return to that road again. I worked as a technician in 2001 for the Joint Warfare Analysis Center in Suffolk, Virginia. 
That's not to say that I was a government employee because all of us there were contractors or civil service personnel. I'd been with the company for four years by this time and had risen to the position of a security system specialist. My job was basically to work with a sensitive compartment information facility, a secure and sensitive room where information is handled. In the case, we were working with U.S. intelligence assets in theater during the lead, up to Operation Enduring Freedom, the invasion of Afghanistan. One of the things I saw during my time was a report generated by some assets on the ground in Afghanistan, having to do with an assimilation of alien life. I've heard all the same complaints that you people say about how the government lies for the people for nefarious purposes. Well, I'm going to divulge a little bit more to that. I was the second one in the morning, usually arriving at seven hours after having already dropped off my son. I always came back in the door of the facility to the security checkpoint. All visitors were expected to enter through there, and it was always under video surveillance 24-7. The main door from the outside wall next to the parking lot was unlocked during my arrival, and there would be two workers standing guard on either side of the door. Nobody was allowed to stand at the door alone, and both members of the entry team were required to swipe their badges for the reader before the door would unlock. This is due to the things that come in this section of the building. We got things from the NSA, CIA, and military, among other things. Things that civilian eyes are never allowed to see. I think this was some kind of alien technology or biological entity the military picked up during their numerous operations over there. We received some interesting stuff during my time there like a live alien foreign specimen of an unidentified species. Although I never saw it myself, nobody was allowed in the room when the specimen was being worked on. In the security section of our facility, there were always at least three technicians with access to that room. The specimen came on a military cargo flight, although they never told us which one. It was kept in a large sealed container, which had been airtight welded shut. Inside the container, there was this alien being. The military brass told us it was an alien life form, but none of us newer guys ever really saw it. The specimen was roughly four feet tall, humanoid with a large head. It was kind of broad across the shoulders. Nobody ever told us what type of being it was. It was just an alien conscripted by the military to be studied for battlefield applications. The one thing people did tell us about this stuff was that the brass didn't know exactly how it worked, but that we were to lock down the facility and let nobody in or out under any circumstances until they did know how it worked. We were all a bunch of 20-something technicians, so our contact with the higher-level brass was pretty much limited to the briefings they would give us just about how to set up each new artifact or specimen that we got. During the initial setup, one of the guys from upstairs showed us how to set up a safe room for this particular specimen. They told us that it was a biological entity and that there were always ways to keep it safe. There was a large bay with several smaller rooms inside that we could use for this exact purpose. The safe room was a large sealed cube with several layers of sheet metal on the outside and airtight welded doors on the inside. It was designed to keep things in and out. This room would be used for any specimen with the immediate high-level containment requirement. During the brief, they told us that the entity inside could very easily escape if we're not extremely careful on how it was handled. They stressed that we were not able to open the doors for any reason, and under no circumstances could anybody be inside with it. I think this was because it could emit some kind of energy that would open the door if left unattended. They also said something about how it's programmed to escape. The way the room worked is that they would slide one of those large square biohazard suits through a chute on the outside of the door. We would then have to put on these suits, go inside with the large toolbox, and slide the inner door shut from the inside before sealing it from the inside with a large metal brace. The toolbox would be used to open a panel on the inside door and access the locking mechanism of the room. The biohazard suits were used for this because there was no way to ensure the entity could not pass through. 
The first time I had to go inside was with another guy named Craig. Everybody was still really new at this, and everybody was sense. Nobody knew exactly what to expect. The outside of the room was huge, maybe 20 feet wide by 30 feet long. Craig and I walked into the small antechamber, and we could see this large metal brace running horizontally across the door. The safe room itself was built like a vault with several metal walls roughly 18 inches thick. I eased the toolbox to the chute and slid it over to Craig, who was standing near the door inside. Craig slid the inner door shut before fiddling with the locking mechanism for just a few seconds. I closed the small toolbox, opened up the panel inside to reveal a keyhole, and slid the brace into place. I closed the door before turning the key over in the lock. The room was now very, very quiet. We would receive several more live specimens of beings sent directly from the military, Pentagon, and other branches that were housed in the same complex. By the time I was done with this job, we had nearly a dozen of these rooms and an uh, assortment of other artifacts from around the world. Most of the specimens were pretty bizarre, even for a freak like me. I saw some things that you just can't unsee. They would take everything away in the middle of the night, while we were sleeping, usually while I was still up drinking, because after seeing those things, nothing can make you sleep. This complex continued its operation until the very beginning of 2003, January, where they were moving the complex over to France. Unless you're okay with transferring, you'd have to find other means of work. I declined the invitation to go there, so I have no idea what's become of that facility. But I'm sure from what I've been told by some guys that did decide to move over there, that the facility is much larger and houses many more things. They even joke about it and call it the little house of due to some of the specimens they have over there. I have kids and family, so I can't really talk about all the specimens I saw, just in case I ever get threatened or my family gets threatened. Sorry, these memories of working there still stand out to me as some of the craziest times. My dad and I went backpacking a few years back. We got to the trailhead later than we had planned and decided we were going to start the hike anyways. Four hours later, the sun is going down and we still had over an hour left till we got to a suitable site to drop down. We're now hiking in the dark with our headlamps when we hear a low growl 20 or so feet off the trail from us. Then we heard something large moving through the underbrush and trees. We both looked at each other and basically ran up the trail as best we could in the dark on a rocky hill. It was 15 minutes before we stopped to catch our breath. Never saw it, but hearing it so close by gave me a shot of primal fear that I didn't know I had. My dad and I went on a hunting trip in upstate New York where it's common to see a bear or two. We visited a reserve, explored lakes and outposts, and overall it was fun. However, while in one of the towers we spotted a furry thing about 200 yards away in the trees and bushes. Hunters aren't allowed to shoot off the outposts, so we didn't think much of it at the time. Later, when we set up camp, we heard footsteps around the tent. I didn't pay much attention, assuming it was a deer or a squirrel, and went back to sleep, but it started getting weirder with heavier and faster circling footsteps. I woke my dad and we both went outside in our boxers with our guns. However, we couldn't see anything and the noise stopped. Thinking I was going mental, I apologized to my dad and we went back to bed. The next day, as we continued our journey, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I felt unsettled, but my dad didn't notice anything off. We set up camp again and saw the hairy thing once more. We watched it for a while until it disappeared and we went to bed. But an hour or two later, we heard something different, heavier, faster footsteps that sounded like multiple beings. Panic set in and I woke my dad up. We both grabbed our guns, and my dad went outside, shining his flashlight and yelling to scare off whatever was there. I was terrified and had tears in my eyes. 
We decided to leave immediately, packed up the tent, and started our hike back to the truck. During the hike, we heard knocking sounds all around us, making us even more anxious. We half jogged towards the truck, but my dad couldn't run due to a knee injury. At this point, I was on high alert, ready for anything with my gun in hand, fueled by adrenaline. As soon as we saw the truck, a blood-curdling scream pierced the air, making us run even faster. We drove to the nearest ranger outpost and reported the incident. The rangers mentioned similar reports, and my dad briefly described what he saw. A seven-eight feet tall creature with a human face and a hairy body. He said there were four of them, but he doesn't like to talk about it often. Sorry for the long story. We were in Wales in 1992 for training exercises that we were to spend the night in the woods on the outskirts of a small town, then head into town for some R&R. &R. As usual, we were eating field rations and had just broken out onto our sleeping bags for the night, and we heard something large moving throughout the woods. A few of the guys from my platoon grabbed their rifles and went to investigate. A minute or two later, the most awful sound I'd ever heard came from the woods. It sounded like somebody trying to scream while being strangled, maybe 50 yards away at most. It wasn't human nor animal in nature, but it was loud. To this day, I struggled to find the words to describe it. It shook me up. A few minutes later, the guys came back from checking out the woods. They did not have a clue what it was. One guy swore he saw something weird. But he was also pretty shaken up, too. We just need to forget about it, and I said we can't just forget about it. I don't know what it was, but there's a chance it was a person. We need to go make sure. The guy who looked just seemed shaken and pale told me it was no person. I'm telling you, whoever it was, they're long gone by now. Well, I'm not just gonna sit here and do nothing, I told them. If you guys are too scared to go back there, then I'll go check it out. At this, a few of the guys who had gone into the woods shook their heads, but most of them just stared at the ground. I'm going to go back there, I told them. So one of my friends who was with me in the platoon told me he would come with me, even though he did have a lack of enthusiasm. The rest of the platoon was less reluctant, and so we all headed back there, minus a few guys, of course. We were not successful. Nothing was found, but we felt like we weren't alone out there in the wilderness. Anyway, that's my story. Haven't experienced anything else in the military quite like it. I've been a ranger for a while now. I've seen a lot of crazy things, and most of it's classified, and I can't talk about it. I'll tell you about one, though. I was driving my patrol car down the highway, and I received a call over the radio that really freaked me out. They had reported that somebody had said their friends were being attacked by something at one of the campsites. I drove over as fast as possible to see what was happening. When I arrived, I saw several cars parked around the campsite, where everybody seemed very nervous about everything. The people who were supposed to be camping here weren't anywhere to be found but they had left behind all their belongings, so it did not seem like they packed up and went home for anything like that. A couple of them were huddled together. They informed me that something very large had attacked them while they were sleeping, and it must have taken one of their friends away. I kept my gun close on me, looking around for anything suspicious. I noticed some very large footprints on the ground along with some bloodstains leading into the woods. The footprints belong to what many people call Bigfoot, even though it's not like any Bigfoot I've ever seen. It was one of the really big ones. There couldn't have possibly been a bear. I didn't see any of the claw marks or teeth marks anywhere. But, more importantly, just the massive size of the footprints alone were startling. I got the call on the radio for backup, but nobody was answering me. I thought maybe they were busy with something else that must have been preventing them from helping. Then, I heard a scream off in the distance. It sounded like there were people yelling for help over at another campsite. At this point, I cannot wait any longer. I sent somebody back to their car to get a rifle while I continued on down the path leading into the forest with blood. When I made it to where the screaming was coming from, 
What I saw will never leave my memory. Whatever I was looking at had to have come from hell. It had three eyes and looked almost like a human, but covered in nasty hair. I can't really describe it to you, but I've never seen anything like this before in my life. There was a family who were having a camping trip with kids, and now they were all gone. The creature had taken all of them. I decided to shoot at it quickly, but I know my bullets would not even slow it down. Whatever this thing was, it could not be killed by normal means. I don't usually talk about my job around other people, but how could I not tell people about what I saw? At least those willing to listen. It was easily one of the most terrifying things I've ever experienced in my entire life. After that day, there were not many reports of unexplainable events happening around these campsites. It's almost as if they kept it as nothing happened at all. I was told to stop patrolling this area after I saw what it did. Not because I'm afraid of this creature, but it's just because of what happened. I'm told that I need to keep very quiet about these things, and if I speak up, well, more than my career will be on the line. My husband, myself, and our 11-month-old baby were spending the weekend at the Oregon coast. We stayed one night and on the second day decided to just watch the sunset and head back home to Hood River after we ate dinner. It was pretty late by the time we reached Multnomah Falls exit and my husband needed to take a break from driving to get some fresh air. We pulled into the parking lot and there were no other cars at all. We parked our vehicle at the west end of the lower parking lot. Our baby was sleeping in the back seat and he and I got out of the vehicle to stretch our legs and get some air. It was a pleasantly warm evening and very clear out. Just a few minutes had passed when all of a sudden we heard noise coming from the east end of the lot. We both looked and saw a very large tall creature coming out of the tunnel where during the day people are walking in and out of constantly. It had to duck down to come through and seemed a bit irritated to have to do so. It came out of the tunnel and stood up tall, pivoting to the west and headed our direction. During this entire ordeal, my husband, now ex, and I never spoke a word. Our voices fell silent as we both watched this thing head our way. As it came closer, my mind tried to decide what it was. It clearly was not a human, too tall to be that. It was not a bear, as its arms were long and actually hung to around its knees at a full stand. It was not a gorilla, as it walked like a human and was too big to be a gorilla. Process of elimination led me to the only logical conclusion. It was Bigfoot. Without a doubt, it was dead silent. You could have heard a pin drop. Wouldn't rational people jump into their vehicle where their precious child was sleeping and take the hell off? Well, to this day, I can't explain the fact that we both seemed frozen on our feet and could not move or speak. At this time, I recall there was no fear. Absolutely none. Anyway, it approached, and as it walked by us, about 20 feet from where we stood, it stopped for just a moment acknowledged us by turning its head to look and made a sound and a slightly irritated wave of its right arm. It then quickly lost interest and continued on, its way heading west in the parking lot. We watched in silence as this huge and obviously dark and hairy creature walked up to a cement wall, firmly planted its hands on the wall and oh so quickly swept its feet and legs right on through as it vanished into the dense forest beyond. Then it was gone. This entire incident lasted only minutes, I'm sure. But living, it seemed to be in slow motion. Once the creature hopped the wall, my husband and I finally looked at each other wide-eyed. All that he said at that moment was, let's get the hell out of here as we got into our vehicle and took off. It wasn't until this moment that I felt physical fear. I began to tremble uncontrollably. My heart was racing at what we had just witnessed. We drove still in silence for a few minutes, and then it seemed that we both at the same moment said to each other, Did you see what I just saw? It was as if we had to confirm it with the other, because it was so unbelievable. 
Yes, we had indeed both seen the same thing. Thank God. No one would believe this story. He believed me, and I believed him. He also told me that he had no fear until it was gone, just like me. Not once did we feel threatened by it, though it seemed a bit irritated by something. Or did we fear for our sleeping baby in the back seat? Figure that one out. That's my story. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for giving me a chance to share it. When I was attending a university about seven years ago, I found myself in a situation that would forever change how I conducted myself outdoors. When classes got out one January afternoon, the county I was in was hit with an intense blizzard. While it was pretty typical to get snowstorms every week in the winter months in that area, this one lasted a good few days, and we got so much snow that the school gave everyone a heads up that classes would be canceled on Monday and Tuesday at least due to predictions of the storm lasting clear until Sunday night. My roommates and I decided we would get our homework done early so that we could spend the weekend exploring some of the thick woods surrounding the campus. Why would 320 somethings be exploring the woods in three feet of snow, let alone howling winds and freezing temperatures? Well, even I think this sounds ridiculous, looking back on it as a grown man. You see, my college was known for its various arts programs that produced a number of gifted writers, painters, and actors. Over the years, many students fabricated stories and false accounts of various bizarre happenings in those woods, ranging from Bigfoot sightings to ghosts and coven activities. We thought the snow would make for an interesting investigatory experience, so to speak. I figured that if there was indeed some supernatural phenomena going on in the woods, we would see things like disturbances in the snow, and the natural silence of almost no one being outside in the winter terrain meant that we would hear all sorts of strange noises with no commotion. To obscure them. I was generally the reasoner of my group, so no one argued with me. We packed some basic supplies into one of my hiking packs and left just a few minutes shy of noon. Long story short, we accessed the woods from a little-known entrance about 50 meters from the parking lot behind the Liberal Arts Lecture Building and hiked about two kilometers into the woods. The scenery was stunningly gorgeous, with the evergreen pines and invasive maple trees saturated with white dusting and snow covering every inch of the forest floor sometimes high enough to completely conceal the underlying shrubbery. Despite this, the area was rather unspectacular, with only the odd squirrel hopping about in complete silence. Eventually, we decided to hike down to a shallow stream that students referred to as Flinger Creek, so nicknamed for the many students and local residents who would fly fish for brook trout in it during the spring months. There were lots of large rocks along the bank, so we thought we would, you know, roll a couple northwest delights and chill there for a bit. Well, we spread an old sheet full of holes and awkward stains on the ground and took our seats, joking about our butts being soaked with freezing snow, water and even colder stones digging into our nethers, as we tried to keep our hands from trembling as we rolled our smokes. Suddenly, a dense fog consumed the ravine, and it became hard to see anything further than around a dozen meters from either direction of our blanket. While this happened quite fast, it wasn't exactly unusual to us. After all, we were next to a river with snow piling up above the embankments, so it only made sense that we would get some fog. After a few remarks, we brushed it off and began to toke up. Afterwards, the fog seemed even thicker than before and as it was nearing three o'clock in the afternoon by this point, we decided to head back before the sun would begin to set, thus dropping the temperature and running the risk of our soaking pants, freezing to our junk. We balled up the sheet, put it back in the backpack, and began to head back. Well, we got lost. We used a fallen tree as a trail marker on the way down to the river, but we actually walked past a tree that happened to have also fallen a few dozen strides from the one we noted. In the spring, this would not have been a big deal, 
but given the sheer amount of snow everywhere, combined with the fog, we could not really tell which way we were headed. My friends started to bicker amongst themselves while I attempted to get us out of there. Eventually, I decided I needed a cigarette to relax and regain focus, especially given that it was now nearly four o'clock and the sun was beginning to set. I stepped under a tree, and upon sparking my zippo, I noticed that the tree I was under had a bunch of weird hieroglyphs and runes carved into its bark. A lot of times, students would do this to trick hikers into thinking they were near some witch or ancient monster, in order to scare them for fun. But I didn't really pay much mind to this, until I heard some footsteps picking up from all around the tree. I called out, go of yourself thinking it was one of my friends trying to scare me i'm a pretty jumpy guy honestly at once they all called out in protest they in fact seemed to be under a tree several paces in front of me where they remained since i broke away to smoke i felt a chill not from the cold weather before replying i heard someone stepping around it was probably a deer or something they made a joke about Bambi stalking me and laughed before they fell silent with an eerie promptness. I'm almost done with this guy, I called out, motioning to crush the cigarette but in the snow, before I was halted by one of my friends via a quite drawn, ouch, sheesh, wait. I got that same chill again. I remained faithful, quietly standing there as if waiting for the infantryman to give the signal to push on. I then heard another step. This time it was a little heavier, like a foot, intentionally pushing all the way through the snow to meet the frozen ground underneath. A moment later I heard the sound of rapid footsteps go straight past me, picking up in speed as they grew audibly fainter. Jeremy screamed in obscenity. I can't quite recall as the other guys shuffled in the snow suddenly as if they were startled. Bear in mind I could not see them from where I was. But I sprinted ahead, whether in diligence or stupidity I cannot remember, until I tripped over one of them, who was on all fours, struggling to get up. What on earth? I shouted as my comrades shuffled around and got their bearings. I could now see them clearly, and I almost laughed at the sight of powder snow all over their bodies, looking as if they got 86 from a trashy club in. 1986 they were all fumbling their words, which didn't seem to improve, even as all of us returned to upright positions. Then Ron, arguably the most confident and bravest of us, straightened his glasses, sighed, and spoke. I don't know what it was, but something big walked right in your direction. Well, what did it look like? I muttered. Hell if I know. I could barely see the spark of your cancer. Stick in this fog. All I could tell was that it was dark, colored, almost like a shadow, and that it was taller than us. He waved his hand frantically over his head, as if to remind me that he was indeed the tallest of us, and he was at least six feet, and was moving your way. It was nuts. I immediately approached this from my usual philosophical perspective. It was probably a moose. We're not supposed to get them this early in the year down here, but... Hey, my uncle told me about a grizzly bear on his property last summer, and he lived supposedly 200 miles away from grizzly territory. Everyone groaned and sighed in silent agreement that this was probably some big animal, startled by our sudden screaming. At any rate, it was long gone, and we decided to use a compass app on my android to get to some road that we could then follow back to campus. After about a half hour of walking in the opposite direction, we wound up just to the left of where we entered the woods. We shouted in celebration before heading back to our dorm. Later that night, just shy of midnight, I stepped out of the residence hall to have another smoke. My joints were a little stiff, so I decided to take a stroll. Like an unsung hero revisiting an old battleground, I walked back to the trailhead we took earlier. Looking down it is the shadowy path now looked to be the throat of some great animal, descending into nothingness as in an almost graceful void. I sighed and turned around to head back. My heart skipped a beat and I was speechless. I could not move or scream. 
only inhaled sharply as I witnessed the most terrifying thing I had ever seen. Towering in front of me, at least ten feet tall, was a being as dark as oil, with a long and twisting neck extending upward and then curling back down in a supernatural arc, cradling a small oblong skull with a wide, gaping mouth. Bearing a bottom row of flat teeth and a strange bony appendage just below what appeared to be a blunted nose, pushed into its face and two beady yet bright silver eyes faced far apart and sitting on either side of that skull. I could make out no further features of this thing, only that right in the center of its awful, somewhat feathery torso, which seemed surreal and featureless. It held a head bearing a stark resemblance to mine, close to its chest, if it had one. My eyes slowly rolled up to meet this thing's before I fell to the ground, laughing maniacally as snow swirled around us. Every night before I go to sleep, I meditate for approximately 30 minutes. I do this to get into a clear and positive space before dosing off. So as every night before, I started my meditation, and it was pretty uneventful for the most time. I would actually say that it has been the calmest I have felt in quite some time even. However, at the end of my meditation, I felt something heavy pressing down on my body. Like some person was sitting on my shoulders and as my legs were shackled to the bed. Although it did feel weird, I didn't think too much of it until my body was asleep already, which usually happens before my mind goes blank as well. This time around my mind did not go blank though, in my pure calmness, yet uncomfortable feeling of being pushed down, a huge dark entity with an enormous mouth entered my thoughts. It scared me a bit, but I stayed mindful. The entity came closer, where eventually it swallowed me with ease. Inside the entity's mouth it was pitch black until a door appeared in the distance. My spiritual side got curious, and without any conscious thought I walked towards it. I opened the door and got sucked into a fiery red cave where one man was sitting. This man introduced himself as the man that makes deals for a living. Without further introduction, he told me he had a deal for me that I couldn't refuse. He would let my wildest financial, sexual, and goal-oriented dreams come true. In exchange, my place for the throne, he continued that I was to take the deal. No further harm would come to me. Yet if I didn't, he would spook my mind until eternity. Without having said a word myself, he showed me the exit and claimed that he will reappear once more when the time has come. I exited the cave back into the dark. There the entity moved me out of his mouth and disappeared from my thoughts. Ever since this encounter I have been pondering if I had an encounter with a devil of sorts, or if this was a higher spiritual being trying to warn me. Although the memory of it scares me, it does not make me panic. On the contrary, it brings me peace. But one thing is for sure. I don't know what to make of this situation and am looking for any advice on this or someone who experienced the same things as me. I was driving a shortcut from 29 Palms, California to Albuquerque, New Mexico. 29 Palms is located in the desolate high desert east of Los Angeles. The shortcut was all two-lane road through total nothingness except for passing through Amboy Cali. Amboy is a nearly abandoned town nearly as far below sea level as Death Valley, with a dormant volcano and lava field on one side and a salt flat on the other. It was also at the time a hot spot for satanic group activity. So I was driving by myself in the afternoon. I stopped in Amboy and snapped a picture of the city sign just to prove I was there to friends who dared me to take that route to a 40. I got back in my car and proceeded to drive up into the mountain range between Amboy and I-40. Once I reach the top, I'm driving north through a canyon with high grass on both sides of the road. Up ahead, I see some stuff in the middle of the road. 
As I approach, I slow down to see a red Pontiac Fyro stop sideways across both lanes. A suitcase open with clothes scattered everywhere and two bodies laying face down in the road, a man and a woman. I stop a hundred feet or so away and the hair on the back of my neck is standing up. Being a marine, I reach under the seat and pull out a 9M pistol and chamber around. Something seemed very wrong. It looked too perfect as if it were staged. An ambush? Was I being paranoid? Something was just wrong. Getting out of the car seemed unthinkable. It was a horror movie. Move! Move! As I scanned the road, I saw a line I could drive. Past the guy in the road on his left. Swerve to the right side of the woman, behind the fire row, and I'd be on the other side. I dropped it into first gear, punched it, and drove the line I planned. I passed the back of the Fiero without hitting it or either of the bodies in the road. I continued forward a couple hundred feet and slowed down so I could breathe and let my heart slow down. As I looked up into the rearview mirror, I saw that the two bodies had gotten up to their knees and twenty or so people emerged from the tall grass on either side of the road by the car and bodies. At that moment, my right foot smashed the gas pedal to the floor and did not let up until I had to slow down for the I-40 East on-ramp. I will never know what would have happened to me had I gotten out of the car to check on the bodies or stopped my car closer to them. Somehow I do not think it would have been good. Sometimes real life can be scarier than a movie. The legends of Whispering Hollow, a small wood area in Yosemite, had always intrigued me, but I never truly believed in cryptids or, or similar creatures. Yet the stories persisted, whispered among the park's visitors, and shared around campfires, a creature simply known as the Beast was said to roam the deepest and most treacherous areas of the park, a shadowy figure that struck fear into the hearts of anyone who dared to venture too close. As a seasoned park ranger, I was used to encountering wildlife and handling challenging situations. However, the rumors of the Beast piqued my curiosity and I found myself drawn to the mystery. Despite the warnings from fellow rangers and locals, I couldn't resist the urge to uncover the truth behind the legend. One fateful morning, I decided to embark on a solo expedition into the heart of Whispering Hollow. Armed with my backpack and a sense of determination, I ventured into the wilderness, following the winding trails that led deeper into the park. The air was thick with anticipation as I delved deeper into the unknown my heart pounding with every step I took. As I navigated through the dense foliage, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The forest seemed to come alive with hushed whispers, and the trees seemed to shift as if concealing something unseen. I brushed off the unease, attributing it to my imagination playing tricks on me. As the sun began to set, casting eerie shadows across the landscape, I found myself approaching the heart of Whispering Hollow. My senses were on high alert, and every rustle in the undergrowth made me jump. But I pressed on, determined to unveil the truth behind the legend. Suddenly I heard a faint rustling sound, like footsteps approaching. My heart quickened, and I instinctively turned to seek cover behind a large tree. I peered cautiously around the trunk, my eyes widening in disbelief at what I saw. Emerging from the darkness, there it was, the cryptid, a large dark figure walking upright, moving with an eerie grace. It was black and shorter than me, with no visible neck that I could discern. My breath caught in my throat as I observed the creature, trying to make sense of what I was witnessing. It stopped just a few feet away, sniffing the air with its nose pointing up, as if sensing my presence. Fear gripped me like a vice, and I struggled to control my trembling limbs. My rational mind urged me to retreat, to run back to safety, but an inexplicable curiosity held me in place. I strained to see its eyes, but the creature's face was shrouded in darkness. Its presence felt both ancient and otherworldly, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was somehow aware of me, watching me with unseen eyes. 
As I stood frozen in fear, the cryptid turned around and walked away casually in the same manner it had arrived. My heart pounded in my chest and my mind raced with a jumble of emotions. Had I truly encountered the legendary beast of Whispering Hollow, shaken to my core, I retraced my steps, deciding to leave the wilderness behind and head back to the safety of the park ranger station. My mind was filled with conflicting thoughts, the desire to protect the park's secrets and expose the truth about the illegal loggers now overshadowed my fascination with the cryptid. In the days that followed, I dedicated myself to uncovering the illegal logging operations and exposing the true villains behind the legend of the beast. As I gathered evidence, I realized that the loggers had fabricated the myth to scare people away and cover up their destructive activities within the park. With unwavering determination, I brought the evidence to the authorities, and a series of arrests followed. The illegal logging operations were shut down, and the park was finally safe from their grasp. Though I managed to protect the park from the true threat, I could never forget that chilling encounter with the cryptid. As the years passed, the memory remained etched in my mind, a reminder of the mysteries that lurked within the wilderness. When I bought an RV camper, me and my friends decided to cruise down the seemingly endless highways of Texas. The sun was beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows over the open road. Inside our newly purchased RV camper, excitement buzzed among our group of friends as we embarked on this cross-country adventure. We had dreams of discovering hidden gems roadside attractions, and the simple joy of the open road. As night fell, fatigue set in, and, and we decided it was time to find a place to rest. That's when we stumbled upon the eerie quiet of an abandoned roadside rest stop. The faded sign, barely visible in the moonlight, hinted at a time when this place bustled with life. Tired but eager for a good night's sleep, we parked the RV in a desolate corner of the rest stop. The surroundings were silent, save for the gentle creaking of the RV settling into place. The air was thick with anticipation as we prepared to sleep beneath the vast Texas sky. However, the stillness of the night was shattered by an odd symphony of noises emanating from the nearby woods. Branches rustled, leaves crunched, and an otherworldly howl echoed through the darkness. Dismissing it as the typical sounds of nature, we tried to settle in. As the night progressed, the noises in the woods became more pronounced, more unsettling. Whispers of the wind turned into guttural growls and shadows danced among the trees. Unease settled over the group, and curiosity got the better of us. With a mix of trepidation and excitement, we decided to investigate the source of the strange occurrences. Venturing into the woods, our flashlight beams cut through the thick darkness. The trees loomed overhead like silent sentinels, their gnarled branches casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. As we delved deeper, an unsettling feeling crawled up our spines, and the air grew heavy with an unspoken dread. Suddenly, in a small clearing, our flashlights caught a glimpse of something massive and hairy, the silhouette of a creature resembling a colossal upright ape stood before us its eyes glowed in the darkness reflecting an unnatural intelligence a chill ran down our spines as we comprehended the enormity of the situation when the creature resembling a massive hulking bigfoot locked eyes with us a low growl rumbled from deep within its chest fear seized us and without a moment's hesitation, we turned and ran back towards the safety of the RV. As we stumbled over tree roots and underbrush, the creature's growls intensified, and the earth seemed to quake beneath its thunderous footsteps. The RV came into view, a beacon of safety in the chaos of the night. With hearts pounding and breathless gasps, we clambered inside, slamming the door shut behind us. The engine roared to life as our driver floored the accelerator, leaving the abandoned rest stop and the menacing creature behind. As we sped away, the woods echoed with the creature's enraged roars fading into the distance.
I can tell you from memory it was roughly midnight, one in the morning. I was right around the area near Lolo Pass. It was my first time working in this particular district, so it made me very nervous knowing about all the recorded sightings and weird experiences everyone had been having before. It's pretty isolated out here, so even if something strange doesn't happen, you're definitely inclined to hear or feel something, so you can't even get cell service there. You feel very secluded. If anything happens to your vehicle or yourself fall out on patrol, this is a place where Bigfoot has been sighted too many times, but to not give it the respect it deserves from a safety standpoint. So anyway, I had already radioed back to dispatch at HQ earlier that evening, saying I was going to be checking up on some puddle, offs between mile marker 44 and 42, right along Highway 12. Quite a few people have seen Bigfoot in this area. It's pretty much just bushy and a lot of thicket on both sides of the highway. It also definitely gets very, very dark out here at night. So there I am, driving down the road and minding my own business, and my radio starts to have issues. I heard voices, but they were garbled and breaking up. There was nobody else out on patrol with me, though, so I thought maybe other rangers were trying to talk to me. But then I realized they aren't saying anything. It's just static noise coming through that kind of sounded like words then all of a sudden this piercing noise comes out over the normal background and i blacked out for what felt like seconds but was probably more like a minute somehow i didn't crash the truck i remember how it felt like that i was stuck in time and could see myself sitting in the car driving but it's like i was looking at everything through a foggy lens I quickly snapped back into reality. It felt very disorientating, almost dreamlike, and then when I came to my senses, I realized that all this had happened while my patrol vehicle was still moving up the road. I tried to contact HQ again, but the garbled noise stopped for good after that moment, and my radio went back to normal. So did my headlights. Everything was fine again. There were no signs of any deer on the roads or anything around here where you would normally expect them to be. This area is heavily populated in deer, and they're always out at night, so did not see any. Very strange that made me confused and, in turn, got paranoid. I just wanted out of here ASAP, so I try not to spend too much time investigating. The next day, when I was filling out my reports and dispatch, one of the other rangers, who had already worked in that district for a long time, told me about this phenomena he called radio fodded. He said it happens all the time when you're out there in what he called ghost territory, which is basically anywhere there's been Bigfoot sightings or activity before. He says the electricity in the air is just different. Your radio starts acting weird and goes black for periods of time. You also feel like you'll black out too. He's had times where he's gone out there, and his blood sugar has randomly spiked. He's fallen unconscious or feels like his nerves and feet and hands are on fire. Strange stuff, really strange. You're alone, and you probably won't notice it, even though it sounds like someone or something is trying to talk to you through the static noise. It's really just interference that mimics voices. If you're with somebody else, though, they might not notice it as much as you, because it feels like time goes by differently when this happens, and you aren't sure how long the blackouts will last for. All the sensations are very bizarre, not to mention something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Well, the day after this was pretty uneventful. Nothing had happened. But I've heard multiple accounts of other rangers, too, having very strange experiences out there in that same spot between mile marker 42 and 44. Even other people who do search and rescue when they have to be in that area and radio in, they also have reported strange radio chatter and blacking out. The only logical explanation that I could possibly come up with for such a phenomenon would be a magnetic field disruption or some other natural effect. That's the only thing because there's nothing else that's going to interfere with the frequency of our brains and bodies or just the energy around us other than a magnetic field interruption. 
I don't know if that's synonymous with Bigfoot activity, but there's definitely something going on. Unfortunately, there's no way to prove something like this one way or the other. It's very odd, though, and makes me think twice before I go out on patrol alone after sundown. I'm not sure what really happens to people who get blacked out by whatever that noise was. I think the best way to describe it is like being caught in a time warp or something, but I could be wrong. Overall, I have not had any other experiences like that night out near the mountain. Certainly nothing as terrifying as what happened there the year before I started working. Let me get into that. So I was just finishing up my last week of training in another district when this guy came into our office looking for advice. He and his friends were planning on hiking up a timberline link, which is already known for having Bigfoot activity, but they said their main reason for wanting to go, there was somebody had posted weird photos of sticks arranged in strange patterns, inciting that there was Bigfoot evidence. They asked if anything strange like that has happened in the area and I knew from past reports that rangers always talked about weird things being found up there, so I just told them to be careful if they did decide to go. Although it wasn't until a week later when my training was finally over, I began working at Timberline where I heard what had happened to them. They left the trailhead one night after it got dark. They thought going early would let them beat all the snow and were getting but only made it a mile or two before turning back around because of how difficult it was trying to navigate across fresh snow drifts, especially that high up the mountainside. The next morning, a ranger out on patrol noticed something strange ahead of him down below all while he was driving up the access road. When his truck got closer, he saw that there were footprints. It was a giant barefoot but it didn't look like a bear or anything else native to the area due to how large, deep, and far apart the tracks were spaced. It looked more like somebody wearing boots with about an extra two feet of depth across each step from what you would expect from someone's actual foot size. Plus, there were only three toes on each side, which is very unusual for any living creature or anywhere else. Mind you, most have paws and several toes. Anyway, the ranger carefully followed the prints all the way to the near Timberline Lake, where they just stopped out of nowhere as if somebody had just taken flight. The ranger tried to follow the tracks back, but it was impossible because they had already been covered with snow at that point, so he called in help from other civil rangers trying to get clues on the types of footprints that were there. They walked around Timberline Lake for hours, looking everywhere, but could not find anything until they checked down at the water's edge near one of the wooden boat docks, and they were more along the embankment, and they stopped abruptly again. This is where they found very weird stick formations, like the same kind you would see in movies like the Blair Witch Project, but on a much larger scale. They just kind of appeared out of nowhere and were very, very creepy. After this, the other rangers and I spent a lot of time walking around this area, but we never found anything else. We could not figure out why somebody would have been wearing boots so big for hiking up the mountain during winter time, although they looked more like human tracks, or whether they could have possibly come from or gone, without leaving any more tracks wherever they disappeared toward. Nothing made sense. It was also weird because there were no other prints leading up to those ones from anywhere near the trailhead, which meant whoever made those had walked all the way up from somewhere down below, on flat ground where there should have been plenty of other footprints instead. It's still a big mystery as far as I know, unless it might be one of the other rangers or park service or another law enforcement group who has been trying to mess with us, but that's very unlikely. The other weird thing is whoever was walking around leaving those tracks would have to have been considerable weight considering the indent in the snow. And then, of course, there was a report from a young woman whose son refused to go into a certain part of the state forest. He was so scared by what he saw in there, and she said his story kept changing whenever she asked him what made him afraid in the first place. He claimed he saw something big walking around staring at him but it wasn't a person like a man or a bear, but claimed it was walking on two legs. Did not look like any type of animal he had ever seen before. 
Sometimes he kept saying that whatever it was had very long arms and legs, but virtually no neck, and his parents even took him to see the local doctor who kind of did an exam on him, but found nothing wrong. Look, I'm not really sure what to make of all this either, but as you've seen, things get pretty crazy out here on the job, and I myself am still very unsure of what to believe and what not to believe. Everything seems so surreal, and to be honest, truth is stranger than fiction. Middle of the night in the Sierra Nevadas, California, inside a debris hut with my dad, Zone X-12 to be exact, we hiked in about six miles for the beginning of the archery hunt deer, get woken to a blood-curdling scream around 2 a.m. right outside our hut. We could only make out a partial shadow through the leaves and twigs. Only way I can describe it is a very furry horse, but standing on two legs. The death sounds went on for two, three minutes while we're freaking out trying to knock an arrow. Spent the rest of the night wide awake. That morning we couldn't find a trace. No footprints or tracks in the dirt, nothing. The first thing that came to mind was that it must have been a mountain lion. We've heard mountain lions scream before, but this was nothing like a mountain lion. It was deeper, more visceral. We haven't been back since. What could this be? In 2010, my adventurous spirit led me to the Himalayas in India. Along with a group of fellow trekkers, we set out to explore the beauty of this untamed mountain. As we trekked up to 12,000 feet, the landscape unfolded before us like a mesmerizing tapestry of snow-capped peaks and rugged valleys. Our excitement was palpable as we immersed ourselves in the stunning scenery. On one particular day, as the sun dipped below the horizon, we encountered a peculiar sight. A man, seemingly intoxicated, stumbled upon our path, accompanied by an astonishing number of goats. It was a bizarre sight to witness this man herding such a large flock of goats at such high altitude. We exchanged curious glances, but decided to continue on our way, leaving the drunken herder and his goats behind. Choosing a spot to camp for the night, we settled on an overhang of a cliff about 500 yards away from the mysterious man and his herd. The thought of a snow leopard in the vicinity lingered in our minds, but we brushed it off as a distant possibility. The night draped around us like a thick cloak, and we huddled in our paper-thin tents. The altitude brought a chill to the air, and we wrapped ourselves in our sleeping bags for warmth. Just as we began to drift into sleep, a bone-chilling scream shattered the serene mountain silence. It was a sound that sent shivers down our spines, unlike anything we had ever heard before. Fear gripped us as we realized the scream was coming from a man, and it was alarmingly close to our campsite. In the darkness, we held our breath, paralyzed with terror. The night seemed to stretch on endlessly as we listened helplessly to the agonizing cries of the man, who was being dragged away by an unseen force. I peeked through a small hole in tent, and I saw a creature that seemed to look like a snow yeti or snow bigfoot, white snowy fur, twelve feet tall, and with red glowing eyes. The encounter was surreal and terrifying and there was an overwhelming sense of helplessness as we heard a life being taken miles away from any town or civilization. The very notion that we were amidst the habitat of such a mysterious and dangerous creature left us feeling vulnerable and exposed. With each passing second, the harrowing sounds faded into the distance, leaving us to confront the reality of what we had just experienced. When morning finally arrived, the sun brought a sense of relief. There was no trace of the man nor any sign of the massive flock of goats he had been herding. As we packed up our camp and continued our trek, we were haunted by the chilling events of the previous night. My family goes on trips to Telluride, Colorado once in a while up in the San Juan Mountains and the Rockies. 
On one trip a year or two ago, I decided to take the gondola to the top of Mount Sophia and walk along some of the trails to get a good look at the stars at around 10 p.m. at night by myself. I walked for about 20 minutes and 200, 300 feet in altitude. It's very steep along the trails on top of the mountain. Away from the gondola station so there wouldn't be any light. The trail I was on ascends from about 10,000 feet to about 13,000 feet at its peak, along the span of the mountains surrounding Telluride. Every 100, 200 feet you go up there is a semi-flat clearing fringed by the sheer drop-off on either side of the mountain spine. I was standing in the second clearing up from the gondola station. It was very quiet, very dark, and there wasn't even the slightest breeze. So quiet, in fact, that all I could hear was my own breathing. Since I was so high in altitude, it wasn't completely unexpected for there to be no animal noises, since most animals don't live that high. But the lack of any sensory input at all, besides the sound of my own breath, really started to freak me out. I was up on the mountain for about a half hour when weird shit started to happen. The first thing that happened was an incredibly low but loud humming sound that emanated from the east side of the mountain, I would estimate that the noise was coming from about 100 feet below the clearing where I was sitting. I thought at first it may be a mountain lion or some other type of animal, but the noise was consistent and lasted for about five minutes in total. After the noise got off, I was understandably freaked out and got up to start heading back to the gondola station to go back to my hotel. As I started walking, though, there was suddenly a loud slapping sound coming from the west side of the mountain. The slapping sound sounded like someone taking a long stick and slamming it against a tree trunk as hard as they could in very fast succession. After that, I started to run down the mountain, which was dangerous considering how steep it was, but I was understandably noping the F out there as fast as I could. The final thing that happened while I was still near the clearing was the humming sound again, but this time it was pulsating almost in sync with the sound of the knocking wood. By the time I reached the first clearing before the one I was on, about 100 feet below where I first heard the noises, it became deathly silent again, followed by a huge gust of wind that shook all the trees violently, then followed by complete and utter silence. I reached the gondola station and got a scolding from the attendant for going out in the dark by myself, but I was so scared I just silently got in a gondola car and didn't respond to his comments. The whole trip down, I kept my eyes shut and my fingers in my ears so I wouldn't see or hear any more creepy things. I'm sure there are plenty of explanations, both natural and human, for what I experienced, but being that isolated at that late at night, that high up in the mountains, is certainly an experience I do not want to repeat. I will say this, if it was local kids or something trying to scare me, they sure committed to a mostly unfruitful and dangerous effort. Not a lot of people... If any went up on the trail where I was that late at night, and the places the sounds were emanating from were on very steep inclines, so steep that one slip would have you tumbling down the whole mountain. So I'm fairly convinced it wasn't locals pranking me. This happened to me a few years ago. I used to go to school at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm a runner, and the campus is in a beautiful redwood forest, so I would run on the trails. One day I left a little later than usual on a run through one of the more isolated trails. Here's where it gets weird. I was about 15 minutes running deep into the woods and still hadn't seen anyone else around. Suddenly up ahead I saw what appeared to be a homeless man in ragged clothing walking on the trail. Now he was walking further into the woods, and this path went very, very far, and the sun was setting. I okay, you, this man was spending the night in the woods. I wanted to reach my usual running checkpoint before turning back, so I decided to keep my distance and run by. As soon as I passed the man, he called out to me, What came first? Lighter sound. 
In my head, I was like, this guy is nuts. But I decided to humor him and yelled out light without looking back. He said, well, I think it's sound, but who knows, and started mumbling to himself. I continued on. I reached my goal and started to head back. It was really dark now, and I was feeling sketched out that I had to pass this guy again to get back. He seemed pretty crazy and potentially dangerous, but I didn't have a choice. I got past the point where I first passed him, but he was nowhere to be seen. There weren't any other branches of the trail, and if he had headed back, I would have seen him by then. He must have gone off the trail. Suddenly, a girl from up on a hill screamed for me to stop. I stopped and looked up on the hill, but it was too dark to see anything. I was freaked out. I called out to ask if she was all right, and eventually saw her climbing down. The hill was really steep, so she put in a lot of effort to get up there and away from whatever was after her. She said that she was on a run when a scary homeless guy started harassing her, and he chased her up the hill. But she didn't know where he went. She was going to spend the night there until I came along because she was too scared to go back down. At this point, we both wanted to get the hell out of there. Who knew if this creepy man was like lurking around watching us from the dark? So we ran back together and made it to the road. She thanked me and we parted ways. Never ran back on that trail again. Santa Cruz can be a pretty weird place. I've heard legends of students flunking out of school there and then just living in the forest. Maybe this guy was a student from years past. It was bow season in the coast range of Oregon. My dad decided that he wanted to take my mom bow hunting and out for a cool experience in the woods. It was evening, and he decided to park his car up on a landing and watch the sunset and stars with my mom. They were asleep in the back of the wagon and were woke suddenly by a guy screaming and revving his old Key 5 while his bright lights were directed at my dad's car. The guy was screaming at my old man to get the F out here. You picked the wrong road to be on. I'm going to blow your elf head off. My dad whispered to my mom to stay covered up and not to make any noise or movement. My old man had been in special forces and had also been an MP. He didn't, however, have anything except his bow. The stranger wasn't having any of it. I told you to get the F out here and I mean it. Now, my dad yelled out the window, all right, man, I'm getting out. He slowly got out of the car while keeping the car between them. My mom said she could hear the guy work the boat on his rifle and just knew my dad was dead. I don't know exactly what was said, but my mom said she heard my dad start talking to the guy, calm as could be. She said she heard the guy and said he sounded like he was drunk or on drugs. Eventually, my dad was able to talk the guy down and he eventually left. After they watched the guy drive up to the next landing and sit there, my dad got in his car and told my mom to just stay put in the back and under blanket while he drove out of there. My mom said that as soon as they took off, they saw the guy start speeding their way. It turned into a car chase on a logging road with a long track to get back to the main road. She said it took forever for my dad to lose him, but eventually they did said she has never been more scared of anything in her life. I don't know if anyone believes in Bigfoot, and I'm not sure if I do, but I wanted to tell this story. I never tell people because I know they won't believe me, and I don't want to be labeled a liar. But here we go. So about five, maybe six years ago, me and my friend snuck out of my house late one night in my house had a river behind it and a forest across the road in front. So we go out and walk around smoking a cigar I stole from my dad. We walked around for about an hour. By then it would have been around 3 a.m. As we got closer to my house walking along the forest line, I turned to my friend and looked past him into the forest. About 10 feet past the tree line, I see a big human-shaped thing with no neck or a very muscular neck and big shoulders. It was looking out at us. I froze and said to my friend, Do you see that he looks over? And starts running as fast as he could, and so did I. 
When we got back to my house, we called it an alien. Didn't know what else to call it. It didn't look human. Wasn't till about three years later that I told my brother about it, and my dad and I had described it to them. It was big, about eight feet tall, had a black body with a gold color head. So my brother looks up what I saw in Google and something called Old Yellow Top comes up described as a Bigfoot with dark body and yellow head. And what makes it even more crazy is the sighting are in Ontario, Canada. And I also live in Ontario, Canada. I think the first sighting is from early 1900s and me and my friend both 20 years old now. Still to this day is where we saw something in the forest that night. All I know is I never felt that kind of fear before, and I don't think I ever will again. We were stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. This was back in 1990. I was still a new guy on my first deployment. I had been in the Army for 11 months and was still considered in the training phase of my military occupation specialty. I was 19, and there were six other guys out with me on a mission, and I was the designated driver. This was a training mission from hell. We were on a recon mission for some reason or another, and we were out of sight of earshot on the countryside. As we were, you get used to seeing wildlife skitter past and hearing it as well. The deer would constantly amble across the roads, rabbits, raccoons, jackrabbits, and all sorts of birds would be seen very frequently. I was driving the lead vehicle, a two-man jeep with all sorts of radios. They were not much for comfort, but they sure got the job done. I drove us down a long stretch of road, and in my rearview mirror, I noticed something large and black run off to the left side of the road into the woods. Once we got past where it had vanished, I thought nothing of it other than that it must have been a deer or something. After all, it was the middle of the afternoon, and I had seen all sorts of wildlife out here before. It wasn't until the sun had started to set again that I now noticed it. I looked out to my right and saw a large black figure, maybe 500 feet away. It was shambling out of the woods and into a clearing. It was roughly man-sized, but it did not walk like a man. It walked slowly and awkwardly, almost as if it were hurt. It was hunched over, and the way it moved its arms, I couldn't quite see what its hands were like. All I could make out was that it was black, but had no discernible clothing or anything on it. It also appeared to be extremely muscular. I sat there in awe for a moment, pondering what it could be. I decided to pull over and find out. I stopped the jeep, turning off the engine. There were no other vehicles in sight, so I thought it was safe to get out. I pulled my rifle off my shoulder and slung it. I grabbed my field radio, switching it on. King to all of us. Hey, is anyone else seeing this? I whispered. All the radios buzzed with static for a moment, and then one of my squad mates answered. Yeah, I don't know, but you should see it too. I said as I walked around the jeep to get a better look. He told me he couldn't see it and said, what is it? Is it on the road? He had asked. No, it's in a clearing to my right. It's walking right there towards the tree line. I'm going to try and get closer, I said. Wait, they told me. I gave a few quick glances back and forth behind me, checking to make sure nobody else was there, and then I carefully crept towards the clearing. I finally got up to the tree line. Looking through the trees, it was gone. My squad mate appeared over the radio. Hey, I can't see it. Where is it? I don't know. It was right here, I swear. I'd whispered back. That's not possible. I wouldn't have seen it. Well, I'm telling you it was here, I said, pulling my field radio off my belt and switching it back off. We sat there a few moments, waiting to see if it would reappear in the clearing. It did not. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and decided to head back to the jeep. I walked with my rifle at the low ready, pointed at the ground, but with my finger resting on the trigger. I didn't tell them that I was heading back yet. I wanted to see if it would reappear. I got back to the clearing and took a look around. Nothing. I turned and headed back to the jeep. I was walking away from it. Then a scream came out on the radio. My squad mate screamed. I shouted back. I heard him scream again. I shouted, what again? 
as loud as I could without attracting the attention from the other jeep. He did not answer. I asked what was going on. So I ran back to the jeep and jumping in. I didn't see the radio man anymore. What's going on and where did everybody go? He had asked. Before I could answer, there was a crashing through the trees. We both jumped out of the jeep to see what it was. What we saw will haunt us for the rest of our lives. It was my squad mate. He was screaming, running straight toward us. He was bleeding from multiple gashes, and he had this black thing chasing him. Whatever the black thing was, it wasn't human. It was a mangled, twisted black figure moving like a man, but not quite human. My buddy from the jeep and I stood there frozen in horror, watching our friend run towards us. We didn't know what to do. When my buddy saw that our friend was being chased by this thing, he turned and ran back. I just reacted, grabbed my rifle, pointed it directly at this being. I pulled the trigger, firing a spray of bullets on him. I don't know if it hit him or not, but he stopped, and when I stopped shooting, he then began to advance on me. I was about to take another burst at him when my friend jumped in the jeep and shouted for me to get in. I jumped in the jeep beside him after getting out to shoot at this thing, and he throws it into reverse and punches the gas. The tire spun, gravel flying everywhere, and he tried to get us turned around for a quick exit. He finally got us pointed in the right direction, and we went flying back out the way we came. I looked behind us for any sign of that thing, but I couldn't see it anymore. As we drove on, I could hear my friend whimpering next to me. He had his hand pressed against the deep, oozing gash in his right arm. I reached into the first aid kit and pulled out a field dressing. Here, put this against the wound. He took it, pressed it against the injury, but not before I saw his fingers were raw and red. He had somehow gotten that gash without realizing it when he was running from the creature. We can now hear this thing chasing our jeep in the woods. It was paralleling us from inside the woods, but just outside of you. We could hear it crashing around. This wasn't possible. I had shot it several times, and it should have been heard badly enough to be able to not keep up with us. After a few more minutes, the crashing in the woods stopped, and my buddy grabbed my shoulder and said, Don't look back. So what do I do? I immediately turned around and looked back behind us. There were several of these beings running after us in the woods. I looked back at my buddy, and he was white as a ghost. I was trying to make out just how many there were, easily over four or five. And they shouted, What are they? I don't know, but we're not sticking around to find out. He nodded, and we kept going as fast as the jeep would allow us. The radio man is screaming, Guys, what is that? And we shouted, We don't know, guys. We heard the gunshots. What is going on out there? My buddy overcame his fear for a moment, trying to explain what he saw as best as he could. I looked back and saw that those things were now running through the woods beside us, keeping pace with our jeep. This was unreal. I don't know how long we drove, but eventually the jeep stopped in front of a guard shack at the same kind of base. I couldn't make out the insignia in the dark, but it did not look like anything I'd ever seen before. We got out of the jeep and ran into the shack. The two guards manning the gate had their weapons pointed at us. What is the emergency? My buddy stumbled, trying to catch his breath, and explained, We, we were headed to the front gate, and, and there's a thing chasing us. We were still in training, and we ran into something in the woods. Please help us. This thing chased us all the way here. The guards looked at each other, and then the closest one to my friend pulled him over to a corner for a private conversation. I couldn't hear what was being said, but I could see my friend's face turn from fear to anger. The other guy approached me. I'm a sorry, son. We can't let you in. I was taken aback by his words. What? I just saw my friend get attacked and chased by something, and you're not going to let us in. The guard's voice is firm but calm. Truth is, you're not authorized to be here. I'm afraid we can't let you in. I was getting frustrated. Nobody comes into this space unauthorized. You have to understand that. Now, please get back in your jeep. I was dumbfounded. What's going on here? This is part of our base. The guard spoke in a firm and resolute tone. I understand you're upset now. Please go. I looked back at my friend, who had a very defeated look on his face. I know it was pointless to argue, and we had gotten out of there quickly. 
doing our best to evade whatever we chased us far into the woods. Everything had gone quiet, and we hadn't heard much of anything now. We eventually did make it back, and we were informed that what, what we had encountered was a part of our training mission. No further questions were allowed. The portion and part of our base that we tried to enter into did not allow trainees in, including us, which was a strict part of a military facility. Everything was coordinated for us to encounter these beings by the military as some sort of training operation. These are things I didn't learn until much later on. I went on to serve for a few more years and got out. I lost contact with all my buddies. Had a truck pull into my deserted primitive camping area on National Forest land around 2 a.m. and stop right next to my tent. Now, in context, I was camping alone. This was a designated camping area, and I was the farthest back from the road, a good 200 feet. I had no fire going, still visible from the road, though. Anyone just wanting to turn around could have done so right at the front. Around 2 a.m., this truck comes in drives all the way back to my tent and stops right next to it, just sitting there. I could tell the type of vehicle by the silhouette its headlights cast through my tent. There was absolutely no legitimate reason for anyone to do that. So I'm there in my small framed tent, which I'd made the bad judgment of setting up with its door towards the road, thus providing me no cover to exit. And all I can do is sit there in my tent with my AR-15 at the ready, freezing my butt off in 39-degree weather because I had to crawl out of my sleeping bag and was just in my underwear. Knowing if they mean harm and there's more than one person, I'm almost certainly dead because I'm a sitting duck. Note, I had the uh, AR-15 in the tent with me because it was bear country. Fortunately for me, they probably decided there wasn't anything worth stealing and left after a few minutes without getting out of their vehicle. All my valuable stuff was locked up in my SUV and all I had visible was some cookware and a small camp stove. I learned a few things from that. One, get a bigger tent that I can more easily move around in and it's quicker to get out of, and two, Always set your tent up with a door facing away from the road to provide some degree of concealment if you need to exit. Remember, folks, not all predators walk on four legs. Some walk on two. We live in New Brunswick, Canada. On July 22, 2023, in the early morning, we were awoken by our six-month-old daughter crying. We heard this on the baby monitor in our room. As usual, we got up to check on him, me to grab her and console her, my wife to prepare a bottle for her. I picked her up, and as I left the nursery, I looked down the stairs to my right, through the garage window. I saw a tall, thin, black entity. I know I saw it, and as I looked at it, darted inhumanly fast out of sight. I walked to the room with our daughter. My wife had the bottle ready, and I tried to get the dog to leave the room with me. He was too scared to leave the room, which is unusual. I eventually coaxed him to follow me. As soon as we left the room, the dog tucked its tail between its legs and headed to the desk in the living room. It stayed under and trembled. I would dismiss this as my mind playing tricks on me. However, when I was 19, and I am 36 now, I had an experience with a tall, slender black being, which has haunted me ever since. I don't talk about it as people judge quickly and won't believe. I used to live and work in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan at Walmart. I also worked at a popular bar or restaurant. Needless to say, I worked a shift in the city until midnight at Walmart, the store was four city blocks from the residence where I was staying. If you have ever worked there, you punch your SIN number into a computer at the back of the store. This starts your shift. I punched out after the shift and walked home. It was dark in the city, but with the lights you could see very well. I walked south two blocks and then cut through the parking lot. When I reached the sidewalk again, I noticed an eerie lack of light, took two steps and heard a metallic sound. 
I looked around, feeling strange, and noticed the city lights were missing. I could not see the store. There was only blackness. Then I heard a metallic cling twice from behind me. I spun around quickly to see an alien gray in color with a triangular face and black eyes. I was not panicked and said hi. The alien quickly shot out of its arm and touched me with a finger on my chest. I was not scared at this point. As the finger touched me, there was a strong electric charge I could feel. This charge paralyzed me and I felt forced fear. Every nerve ending in my body reverberated with this shock. The fear I experienced did not come from me, but felt forced, and it was one thousand times stiflable than any I had ever endured. The fear was so intense that my heart pounded instantly. I had to focus quickly and steadily on slowing my pulse as I didn't think my heart could sustain my life otherwise. The next thing I knew, I woke up on a metallic rectangular table with six, seven to eight foot tall, thin black beings standing around me. And oh my God, one had its hand inside me. It felt like it tore me apart. The pain I remember and the forced fear are still there. I am paralyzed, trying desperately to move. The entity towering above me passed through my entire body. It felt like it tore me apart and put me back together. Unimaginable pain. I blacked out. The next thing I know, I wake up. It's all black and I'm on a metallic floor. I hear clinging to the floor. I see four of these tall black entities. They kick me, hurting me more. I try to move, but I'm still paralyzed. Fear running through every nerve ending in my body. I can't fight it. It's almost electrical. I feel like I'm going to die here. I don't want to die here. No, dear God, no. I grow angry as I get beat. I look in my mind and struggle with all I have trying to move to do anything. I force a little movement. I raise an arm, but my body is still isn't cooperating. It takes everything I have, but damn it, I'm dying here fighting. The rest of me cannot move as I swing and I hit one of the entities, causing the fear to become even stronger and the paralysis to become even worse. My body becomes limp, trapped in my body, scared and unable to get up. I black out. The only thing I remember next is waking up in bed at home, trembling and convulsing uncontrollably, completely paralyzed and suffering the forced fear. I want to move, but I can't. The pain in my heart is unbearable. My heart beats like it's about to explode. My body feels like it's vibrating from my heart beating so fast. My focus is on preventing death with all I have. Slowing down my heart helps me calm it. I, I try to move, but it feels like four hours. God only knows. I'm still paralyzed, still in that damn fear. Finally, I broke free. I walk upstairs. My mom looked shocked to see me explaining to me I was absent for three days, thought I was at a friend's. In my mind, I missed no time. I thought I had a nightmare. I told myself I had a dream. Not so lucky. I checked the computer at work, and it showed I was there. No one at work recalls me being there. They told me I had missed my shift. I had no memory for three days. What is the power to do this? The only thing that proved I wasn't insane was the computer. My memory is absent for a day. I saw that damnable thing again tonight. I loaded the guns and waited for daylight. I last saw it when I was 19, and I am now 30, six years old. My memories of it used to be so awful that I'd remember pieces over the years. I would wake up paralyzed in sweat and terrified. I fought the fear in my mind until I could remember and not enter into convulsions, still function and still move. I would have dismissed what I witnessed tonight, but I've seen it before. No one believes. No one cares. Not sure why they came back, but I felt I needed to write this. This incident involved my fiance in April 2011. To this day, she refuses to talk about it, but I decided to post it here to see what others can get out of it. We then lived in Bangor, Maine. It was around 10.30 p.m. that evening. 
I was on a late shift at work, and she was home alone with our cat in our apartment. She said she read while the cat slept on her lap. A moment later, the cat stood up and stared intently at the outside door. He then mewled and scampered into the bedroom. He had never acted like that before. So she assumed it was just another weird thing cats do. Just as she got comfortable again, the doorbell rang. She thought it was strange that someone would want to visit at that time of night. She got up and peeked through the hole, but saw nothing. So she turned away from the door when there were three loud knocks. She was immediately alarmed, but curiosity took the best of her, and she cracked the door to see who was there. She saw a boy around eleven or twelve, though short, standing there. She opened the door to ask what he wanted. She assumed that this child had either gotten locked out of another apartment or asked for help. That's when he looked up at her, and she noticed his eyes. The light from the apartment spilled out into the hallway, affirming his black eyes. She claimed she was paralyzed by shock as the child demanded entry. By that time, the cat had come out of the bedroom and lay on the floor behind her, ears folded back and hissing. She said she felt compelled to say yes, but as she stared into those cold black eyes, she suddenly slammed the door and locked the deadbolt. She claimed that she listened to the child's footsteps in the hallway, but heard nothing. After several terrifying minutes, she peeked out the door and the child was gone, or disappeared. She said she had never been so scared in her life. She thought the cat's hissing interrupted her paralysis, allowing her to regain her thoughts and quickly close the door. She never discusses it, though I'm sure she wonders what may have happened if she had let the black-eyed boy into the apartment. Every town has its urban legend. Bigfoot, Mothman, Dogman, and of course the occasional ghost story, such is the case for the town of Wintermill. Along the northern border of the town lies the Sherman Lake, or as it's been called lately, the Lonely Skaters Lake. The story begins with a young woman with hair like golden silk. She was elegant graceful and a goddess on the ice. Every winter when the lake froze over, she was the first to put on her ice skates. Her agility and skill was so great that any onlooker would be stilled into silence. Her movements caught the sunlight just right, sending beams glistening off her golden hair and silk-white tights. She was preparing herself for the Winter Olympics and dreamed of that golden medal around her neck. So, every winter she was out on the ice, and her skills grew ever greater. One year there was a warm winter. Weeks went by without the temperature dropping long enough for the lake to freeze. The woman waited impatiently, ticking down the days till spring and growing desperate as it approached. Finally, on a chilly winter night, the temperature dropped enough for the lake to freeze, and out she went. She didn't often skate at night, but... Having missed so many days, she was desperate. She slid and glided along the ice, and silver moonlight danced off her yellow hair and sharpened skates. Unknown to her, she was being watched. From the shores of the lake stood a man, many think to be a scorned lover. He put on his own pair of skates and went out to her. She was so focused on her routine, she didn't notice his approach. She only became aware of his presence when his hands went around her waist. He skated in sync with her, lifting her and twirling her around as they danced on the ice. No one knows what was said, but that she turned him down once again, and for the last time. He had his hands on her dainty hips skating behind her. Red flashed before his eyes, and he lifted one foot with glistening steel. The man swiped the bottom of his skate against her heels, slashing both of them. The woman cried out, falling to the icy ground and screaming in pain. Her Achilles tendons were slashed wide open, and blood stained her white skates and tights. The heat from her blood proved too much for the recently frozen ice, and it melted beneath her. Down she was sucked into the blackness of the lake, her voice crying out in large, shimmering bubbles. The last thing she saw was the silhouette of the man against the silver moon. Since then, and for every winter yet to come, when the lake freezes over, some say you can catch a glimpse of the once-talented young skater. She glides on the ice as a shimmering white silhouette 
the moonbeam still dancing off her. But where she skates, she leaves a long trail of shimmering red, melting the ice wherever she goes. You can sometimes still hear her screams before she disappears below the ice in a cloud of red and white smoke. I was talking on the telephone when a foul odor suddenly filled the room. It was a strange and unsettling scent that made me uneasy. I decided to go to my bedroom, but as I entered, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me. My instincts were on high alert, and I felt a sense of foreboding. Looking out the window, I was astonished to see an oval-shaped object with portholes, surrounded by red, green, and white lights that were revolving around it. It hovered about 100 feet above, and its diameter was an impressive 75 feet. The sight was surreal, and I was both fascinated and frightened. I immediately woke up my husband, Everett, and he saw it too. We were both taken aback by the mysterious craft in the sky. I felt the need to share this bizarre encounter with my married daughter, Mrs. Janet Emery, who lived about a mile away. The Emerys also witnessed the unusual sight, and their neighbor even saw it through binoculars, confirming its extraordinary nature. Janet went outdoors to observe more closely and saw the UFO eject a red ball which moved in an erratic manner while the first UFO departed southward. The red ball flew just a few feet above her head, and she described it as oval with a shiny underside that resembled aluminum foil. It was larger than her cottage and yard combined. The whole experience was accompanied by the same foul odor that I had initially smelled. When I finally went to bed, the strange odor still lingered in the house. After some time, the room was suddenly filled with a brilliant white light, illuminating everything around me. It was an instant that felt like eternity. Then, as quickly as the light appeared, it vanished, leaving me startled and bewildered. Right at the foot of my bed, a globe of light, about 21 inches in diameter, materialized. Inside this globe were five beings with non-human features. They had hairless heads with oval, sunken eyes, and instead of noses, there were only slits. The most unsettling part was that they had no mouths. The communication with these beings was telepathic, and they repeated the message. We have made contact several times. The encounter was beyond anything I could comprehend, and I couldn't contain my fear. I screamed in terror, and in an instant the globe of light disappeared, leaving me in a state of shock. The experience left a profound impact on me, and I was so disconcerted that I sought psychiatric care for the next two years. The encounter with those enigmatic beings remains etched in my memory, a haunting and unexplainable event that still baffles me to this day. I was alone on my way home from vacation. I was driving a pickup pulling a camper. It was after 11 p.m. on a summer night. I was about two hours from home, but wanted to get home. Yet that night, I was traveling through a wooded area. It was about 50 miles of just trees on both sides of the road, with an occasional house every five or so miles. I saw something move up ahead. I immediately slowed down, thinking there was a deer in the road. As I passed, I saw a young woman walking on the extreme shoulder near the ditch. She was walking with traffic. She had on knee-high socks. A very short, pleated-type cheerleader-type skirt and a halter top. She was tall with long brown hair. Since this was the middle of nowhere on a road that sees only a few cars per hour, I immediately assumed she was in some sort of trouble. Fight with a boyfriend and left stranded. Car trouble, etc. I was not going very fast at this point, so I pulled over, hit the emergency flashers, set the parking brake, grabbed the flashlight, and got out and went back to see if she needed assistance. When I got to the rear of the trailer, she was gone. I shined the flashlight up and down both sides of the road, the ditches and even the tree line, but saw no one. I drove the rest of the way home with the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. The year, 
1990, Desert Storm and Nelson Mandela being freed from prison. Myself and three friends, while serving in the British Army, traveled to Brighton, England, for a few days of R&R holiday. The weather being particularly hot that year, we were wasting no time enjoying it. Myself and my friend Andy decided to go for a walk along Brighton Pier, famous for its amusement arcade and ice cream. Whilst there, we got to speaking to two young German girls from Nuremberg, and we hit it off immediately. They spoke broken English, and we tried our best World War II movie German commandant accents with them. For the next few hours, we all laughed and joked about everything with each other, and the language barrier became less of a distraction as the evening wore on. One girl was a blonde and the other a redhead. Both beautiful and way out of our league, and yet they liked us and wanted to know more about us. As we were both in the awkward teenage years, myself and Andy didn't know which girl liked who, and I was just glad to get some attention from the opposite sex. After a while, we all decided to meet again at the same time and place the next day. They left the pier to join friends while we waited for our other two friends to join us. The following evening filled with nerves and apprehension. Myself and Andy made our way to the pier. Standing at the entrance were these two beautiful German girls, all dressed up in tight dresses waiting for us. I couldn't believe my luck. We all walked to the pier and got some food before deciding we should all go to the cinema to see Bird on a wire starring Mel Gibson. Myself and Andy looked at each other, knowing that this would be the ideal place to find out which girl liked who. We made our way to the pier exit, but at this point, for the strangest reason ever, Andy walked ahead of all of us and ran across the large open road in front of us. I called him back, but he continued to run toward the other side. Knowing that he was heading in the wrong direction to the cinema, I apologized to the girls and asked them to stay where they were so I could return my idiotic friend. I ran over to the other side, approximately 20 meters in width, where he was standing at. I grabbed him and said, What are you doing? The cinema is this way. He could not provide any reason or rationale for his behavior. At this point, we both quickly headed back to the other side of the road, but to our bemusement, the girls were nowhere to be seen. This is less than 10 to 15 seconds since I spoke to them. Now, if you could picture the scene at Brighton Pier. It's a long, wide-open road that stretches out a long distance and would require some amount of running for the girls to hide, especially running in the dresses that they were wearing. We looked everywhere for the next few hours searching the pier pretty extensively, but to no avail and eventually giving up and being annoyed with Andy. The next day at the same time, we came back to the pier to seek out the girls, but they never showed up. The next day we had to leave to go elsewhere and never got the chance to speak to those two German girls from Nuremberg. Andy and me lost touch, not long after that, but caught up 25 years later. After a few war stories and some alcohol, the topic of Brighton came up. We discussed what happened that night. Maybe after all this time, Andy would have a different view of the story that I had on it, but he didn't, and to this day, he still felt as I did about it. Spooked as hell. We both discussed. Where did they go, and what happened? Why did Andy walk away without reason? How could we not see them run away if that is what they decided to do? So many more unanswered questions. To this day, I don't know if those two girls from Germany are alive, dead, or just part of our imagination. Or was it something more paranormal? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.